Um, so I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, bathrooms are right outside the doors. If you need them, um, feel free to use them. Um, we do have breakfast over here, so that is free for you to uh, grab. And then uh, garbage, trash cans back there. Um, I guess I didn't introduce myself. I'm Anna Druin. I am at the Airmen and Family Readiness Center, and this is Robin Kramer, and she is there as well. So we will be hosting uh, newcomers today. So um, I want to go through some of the items that are in the folders. So if you will please open them up and take a look at the left-hand side. Uh, the first sheet that should be on top is our agenda. Um, this is our tentative agenda, so bear with us because sometimes briefers have things come up where we have to move things around, so it might not be in order throughout the day. Um, so just please keep that in mind. If you take a look at the second sheet, um, it is our SOU. Please fill that out um, because I will need to collect those at the end of the day. So please fill that out as much um, with all the accurate information. The following sheet behind that is our sponsor program questionnaire. It is, uh, if you will just take a look at it, answer the questions accordingly, um, just based off of your sponsorship when you arrived here and um, how well they, they, they did, I will send that over to your squadron so your CSSs can see that, so that if there's any, any areas that need to be improved for your sponsorship program. Um, and then the following sheet is our base newcomers orientation knowledge assessment. Please take a look at that and fill it out um, about your knowledge of the topics that we'll be covering today. Um, and then when those individuals come in and brief, and then rate them after afterwards, you know, so we can see if you gained any any new information. Um, and then the last sheet is for our key spouse program. So if you will just complete that, if you are if you have a spouse, and I will we will get that over to um, the individual at the Family and Family Readiness Center. So um, those the the paperwork on the left hand side, I need to collect at the end of the day. So please, please, please fill it out. Um, and I will remind you throughout the day as well. On the right hand side is just kind of some information for you guys just to have, um, we do have our Airmen and Family Readiness Center uh, brochure in there. So if you just wanna take a look at that, it has all of our programs um, that we have, but we'll kind of go through that throughout the day as well. Um, and then that le those last two sheets is for TRICARE, so when TRICARE comes, she'll cover that as well. So if you, when we kind of have some breaks, if you want to take a look at the stuff on the right-hand side, please feel free to do so. Um, does anybody have any questions so far? Quiet bunch. Okay. It's early. <laughs> We do have coffee, so once I see that it is low, I will fill it up because if you're like me, I need to stay caffeinated throughout the day. Um, and we are going to start out with Master Sergeant Kramer. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Good. A little bit of energy, a little bit of light. I like it. All right. As she said, I am Master Sergeant Donald Kramer. I'm an instructor with the, the 312. Uh, today I'll be providing y'all with the wing mission brief, giving you a little bit of history and heritage for what Good Fellow stands for uh, and what we do here. So first of all, welcome to Good Fellow Air Force Base. Who's been here for a few weeks, a couple months? All right, so some, yeah. Okay, so at least we got you kind of in time here. All right, so Good Fellow is home to the 17th Training Wing. Our mission here is to train, transform, and empower our joint coalition forces. Goodfellow is located at the heart of West Texas. It's one of the oldest bases in the United States Air Force. And also we have ridiculous temperature swings, so enjoy that. Uh, it's gonna be a beautiful 70 degrees today and about a good 16 degrees tomorrow, I think. The base was established uh, initially as the San Angelo Air Corps Basic Flying School on August 17th, 1940. The next year, the base was officially renamed Goodfellow Field in honor of one of San Angelo's own, Lieutenant John Goodfellow. 
and he died during the First World War, uh, September 1918. Eighty years later, Goodfellow is still a staple of the St. Angelo community. This is one thing that we cannot harp on enough. Um, our partnerships and our connection with San Angelo is just so key to how we operate and how San Angelo operates as well. Initially created as a pilot training base, Goodfellow graduated nearly 10,000 pilots during World War II. Among those that passed through Goodfellow included Bill Farrow, a member of the Doolittle Raiders, so famous for their daring raid on Tokyo. Somebody uh, actually knows who that is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Goodfellow's mission of training pilots continued after the war as well, switching from aircraft like these to the uh, multi-engine B-25 missiles. After training more than 18,000 aviators, in 1958, our flying mission came to an end. Uh, instead, we were switching to training intelligence professionals. We kept growing and changing our mission. Um, in 1966, the base expanded our intelligence training mission to include all the armed services. And in the late 1980s, the Air Force consolidated all Air Force managed intelligence to Goodfellow. Uh, that's when my career field, 9100, actually um, got stationed here. We, we moved our training from Maui. So, uh, in 1993, Goodfellow's mission expanded again. This time, we moved the DOD fighting, uh, firefighting to Goodfellow. The base was selected for uh, basic and advanced fire protection training that would eventually include all of the DOD. We also became home to the historic 17th training wing. 17th is one of the oldest and most prestigious of the Air Force um, units, dating all the way back to World War I, so still going back to that um, daring brain on, uh, oh, sorry. So uh, we also, uh, sorry, the 17th training wing also uh, helps support those, uh, those missions for Doolittle, sorry. Uh, that's that picture on the bottom right. Um, so, uh, our history and our heritage here at Goodfellow is, is visible across the base. Who's seen the static displays across the base? Hmm. Wondering what they are? Have you ever got a, uh, got a chance to walk around them? So, how I recommend it. I do it with my kids every now and then. Uh, my son thinks it's a great adventure. So we've got the RQ-1 Predator. Uh, we have the world's largest firefighting memorial huge collection of uh, firefighting vehicles. We have the RQ-4 Global Hawk, as well as the AT-6 Texan, um, which harks back to our pilot training base. So that's one of the planes that they actually flew and trained on. After 80 years of service, we produced 18,000 pilots, 60,000 firefighters, and 360,000 ISR warriors and counting. So kind of ridiculous on how many people we trained. The wing is commanded by Colonel Matthew Rowland and the uh, Vice Commander, Colonel James Finlayson, and we have our Command Chief, Chief Master Sergeant Rebecca Arbonum. We also have the wing staff agencies working directly for the Vice Commander. This includes the 17th Comptroller Squadron, Public Affairs, and the Commander's Action Group. So a lot of little organizations all uh, up there at the wing staff. Goodfellow today serves a population of over 12,000 people. Um, as you can see on the slide, we've got um, a significant amount of retirees. There's only 120,000 people in San Angelo, 4,000 of those being retirees. You're going to run into them a lot. Um, 2,000 dependents, and then 700 civilians, about 1,600 from a party. And then we have usually about 3,000 to 3,500 uh, students on base at any one time. Um, the student load for the 17th training wing itself is about 4,500 students. I know that's different than 3,500. That's because we're not just here at Goodfellow. We have several bases um, that are underneath the 17th training wing umbrella. We teach 95 courses a year. We're able to, to offer 95 courses, and we teach about 700 classes per year. Um, we also have international officers that we train here from over 35 allied nations. So pretty cool. Um, you'll see different uh, officers, different uh, nations and stuff. Uh, most of them will wear some kind of rank on their collar to signify what their equivalence is in our, our service. Um, we have a master sergeant over at the fire department. Um, he wears a uh, master stripes here, uh, as well as his own. Helps us out so we don't you know, accidentally sleep there in the city. Alright, as I said, uh, we stretch from coast to coast. 17th training consists of five installations in total. 
Uh, we have Arlington, Virginia, where we have Defense uh, Language Institute, Washington. We have Quarry Station, Florida, which hosts Air Force students who attend the Joint Cyber Analysis and Signals Analysis courses run by the Navy. Of course, Goodfellow Air Force Base here, Fort Huachuca, uh, which oversees Air Force students and Human Intelligence courses run by the Army. And then finally, Presidio of Monterey, California, where we host the largest number of students outside of Goodfellow. Under the umbrella of the 17th training wing, we have four groups. And the first of them is the 17th training group. So that's kind of important for what we do. Um, you're fixing the monitor. Um, this is commanded by Colonel McGinnis, Angelina McGinnis. Uh, she will be leaving in the next few months and we'll have Colonel Culture uh, taking over for her. Um, he's coming from headquarters Air Force. He's running um, DNI, so the, um, diversity and uh, inclusion for the Air Force. So we have five squadrons underneath the 17th training group. We teach about uh, 3,000. Uh, 300 students um, at any one time, and we graduate about 10,000 annually. Uh, graduates go on to serve line combat units and national uh, level agencies worldwide. And they have an immediate impact on today's um, fight. Uh, that's one of the foreign officers, so that's the kind of thing you expect to see. All of their um, uniforms look different, so you can see all the ones in the back. Next, we have the newest of the training groups. We have the 517th training group commanded by Colonel uh, Jennifer Saracino. Uh, this is located at the Presidio of Monterey, so over in California. This group is in, uh, integrated with DLI, the Defense Language Institute, and is essential to train students from 24, or 24 different foreign languages with a daily student load of approximately 1,300 students. They, uh, the graduates serve everywhere from the cryptologic linguists and foreign area officers to presidential translators and special agents. Um, some of them even have a chance to participate in LEAP, the Language Enabled Airman Program, and the Olmsted Scholar Program, or even Foreign uh, Professional Military Education. The next we have the 17th Mission Support Group, commanded by Colonel Eugene Moore III. Uh, the MSG consists of six diverse squadrons, including security, communications, logistics, contracting, human resources, and community support. Um, they're responsible for about $1.2 billion worth of real property and equipment. Um, they oversee about $38 million in government contracts with an operational budget of about $41 million. Um, they also provide support to our um, fire cabinet. They have, um, which area is it, right? Um, so we also have the uh, largest SCIF, so sensitive and marginalized. Um, Information Center uh, facility in the Air Force. So pretty crazy. Um, who's in the train squadrons? 315, 316, or at least one person. Um, so those are massive skills, and we have several of them all days. Um, they also support SIPR, so it's the largest SIPR network in AETC. And they also help to support the recreational camp by providing um, facilities and activities, um, the uh, DFACs. Uh, who's been out to the right camp? Right. So once uh, summer comes along, that place is moving. It's a really nice place to go. Um, it sits right on Lake Nasworthy. Uh, there's a big old swimming pool there. Uh, there's a dock you can rent boats. Uh, pretty much all the, the normal stuff that you can do at a right camp um, that has water on it. And last but not least, we have the 17th Medical Group commanded by Colonel Derek Larby. So it consists of two squadrons serving our population of 12,000. So they have about 200 uh, clinic providers there, and they provide a normal variety of outpatient services to include student health, family care, pediatrics, women's health, and flight medicine. They also operate a dental clinic and offer specialty services such as physical therapy, optometry, immunizations, and radiology. All right, so I've said it a few times, we are a joint base. Uh, we do have all services here, so all the services. The largest of our uh, installation tenant units is the Army's 344th Military Intelligence Battalion, 
This is commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Joe Garwicki, and it consists of over 200 instructors and support staff, and they train about 1,400 students annually. We also have a firefighter detachment of Delta Company 169th Engineer Battalion, and they oversee students and staff at the Lewis F. Garland Fire Academy. We have the Marine Corps Detachment, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Arturo Derryberry, and it's made up of nearly 100 instructors and staff, and they help train and support more than 1,200 Marines each year. Um, again, those are both at uh, the intelligence training as well as uh, firefighting training. Also, on the middle is the Navy Center for Information Warfare Training Detachment, led by Lieutenant Commander Mark West, responsible for training and supporting nearly 600 sailors annually. Uh, next, we do have guardians on base. Don't call them Mary. Don't remind you they are guardians. Fantastic. Um, we continue to work with them and work with the Space Force to uh, give them a permanent presence here. In addition to this, we also have Coast Guard. There we go. Uh, we have one permanent staff member and we train uh, and support about two dozen Coast Guardsmen per year. All right, the good stuff. All right, San Angelo. Um, we have an outstanding relationship. Leading the Air Force with the most active community partnerships. Um, this has led to us winning the Altus Trophy twice. Um, this is for the best community-based relationship uh, in all of the ATC. Uh, we are the only base to have won that trophy twice. Um, and the commander is convinced that we would have won it again if they had run it um, during COVID. So they, they haven't done another run yet. Um, we do a lot of support. They provide a lot of money. Um, if we have new facilities going up, they can provide a lot of money, a lot of grants to help us build those facilities, help us take care of airmen. Um, and then we, as airmen, were able to go out in the community and help them volunteer. And um, just there's so much, uh, there's just so many like, little things that we do with um, San Angelo. Uh, for instance, uh, on Monday we did a partnership with their NAACP chapter uh, for the Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, we actually had a clean up at the MLK Park. Um, and that's just like one of those little um, pieces that we have. So we continue to build on our history, our heritage, and our critical relationship with San Angelo uh, to continue our mission to train, transform, and empower our airmen. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, do you have any questions? Has anybody wondered about the sheep on base or um, in the city? Yes, a couple people. Um, so my wife, uh, Robin, right there, we have the same last name. <laughs> Turns out, <we're> Renee. <laughs> uh, she's actually born and raised here in San Angelo. Um, she explains to me that uh, the sheep are because San Angelo was a sheep town. Um, they, uh, most of their profit, most of their uh, revenue was uh, brought in by uh, raising sheep. Uh, there was a really bad storm one year that uh, wiped out and flooded a lot of the uh, sheep farmers, a lot of sheep ranchers, killed a lot of sheep then, and then um, the ones that didn't die from the floods and died from the storm actually died from getting sick. There was you know, seven dollars of them. Um, so it kind of shut down all of uh, Angela's like, sheep herding. Um, that's one of the things that's really important. Like The base supports San Angelo, and San Angelo supports uh, the San Angelo probably wouldn't be here or be what it is today without what we provide to them. Um, all those students going in uh, out of town uh, and spending their money, right? That helps to invigorate their economy. Uh, the downtown, has anybody been here before, right? A long time ago. Long time ago. So 10 years ago, 15 years ago, downtown was nice. Uh, because of our support and what we do with San Angelo, they built up this awesome like hipster downtown area with all these cool restaurants. They even have a um, uh, escape room and everything. Um, and the sheep are part of their heritage. Right? So it's a it's an honor for a business to have a sheep in front of them, like in front of their business. And it's kind of a, kind of says to the city, hey, we're here to stay. We're not going to like close up our doors and move. Um, and then on base we have a sheep for least every training squad, so 315, 316, and uh, 312 all have one. And I can't remember if the 313 have one yet. Um, but they're a relatively new squad, and they've only been around for about three years. So, um, yeah, that's what the sheep are. So how, if they don't have a 
sheep? How do they earn sheep? Or how do they get sheep? Uh, there's a warehouse of sheep. That they can ask for one. They can oh, I see. That's all they have to do. Oh, oh, they have to pay them. There's a certain price for it. I don't remember how much it is. No. Um, but yeah, they just pay for it. And then they commission an artist to paint it. Um, and you can get it painted however you want. The, the rattlers, they have one that looks like a rattler. The, and it's a 315 I stuff. And then the, the sharks, they have one that looks like a megalodon that has an actual shark fin on the back of the sheep. Uh, 312 our sheep is a wolf. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. And it's terrifying. <laughs> like, like bloody jowls and everything. It's, it's pretty awesome. Wearing a fire hat. So. Um, and because minus 100 are there and watching it go to explosions, there's a new on the side of it. Well, seen the three by the symbols. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's what they do. Oh. So they just get one of the sheep that's in the warehouse and commission artists to paint it or add ceramic to it. Any other questions? So there's multiple sheep on the There are, yeah. You should do like a scouting group and try to find one. <coughs> but I, I think there's only four. Anything else? Right. Thank you again. Um, I hope you guys really enjoyed your time here. This newcomer's orientation is fantastic, and I know that Annika and Robin worked really hard on putting this together. Thank you.
All right, all right. Well, welcome, uh, Colonel James Cobra Finlayson. I'm your Vice Wing Commander. On behalf of the Wing Commander, Colonel Matt Bauman, and our Wing Command Chief, Chief Master Sergeant Rebecca Arbone, I want to welcome you to the 17th Training Wing, Driftwell Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas. Before we get started, while I'm doing the welcome thing, we're very lucky to have with us today our 17th Training Group um, Senior Enlisted Leader, Chief Brian Albert. She's got a uh, she's a wealth of knowledge, so uh, you can hear her with all the hard questions, whether you're in the 17th Training Group or not. She's a dance mom, as I'm a dance dad, we can tell you all the goodness in town. But while I'm doing all this welcoming, I do realize that if, uh, this is the kind of place if you're a fire professional or an ISR professional, you come back here frequently. So go ahead and raise your hand if you're what I call one of our return offenders. You've been here before. Well, for you guys, I'll say welcome back home. Um, hopefully, uh, I won't, well, not hopefully, things have changed for the better um, in, the, in the time I've been here and they'll continue to improve. But hit me up with all your hard questions. So here we're going to kind of play this game. Is, um, I'm still kind of pumped up for my morning workout. I know it's kind of early, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm going to let you uh, tell you a little bit about herself and where she's been and what she does here and what she loves about the base, the wing, and the, the town. And then we're going to go around quickly. And if you just kind of tell me uh, first name, what unit you're coming into, um, uh, where you, you PCS in from, and then just a fun fact about yourself. So as I mentioned, uh, Colonel James Cobra Finlayson got the call sign from working in fighter squadrons as a young lieutenant. I would say for shenanigans, but um, you can imply that it stuck with me more than the name Finlayson. People will remember Cobra. I've uh, been in the Air Force now 24 years. Um, came through the schoolhouse here in 1998, and this whole town and base has changed significantly in that time. Some great assignments uh, from Vegas twice to Miami, Tampa, uh, the Joint Staff at the Pentagon. Probably one of my favorites was Masawa because it was a, a small community and that was my first base uh, being married, so that's a fun place in our heart. And then I came here directly from uh, Stratcom and uh, up at Offutt in Omaha. So left the job, it was a little too cold for me to live up there, so I'm glad to be back home in Texas. Originally from El Paso, Texas, about six hours away, but um, loving it. Uh, been here a year and a half, and it's uh, my pleasure to serve here, and then this summer go take a wing command down at the Air Force Technical Application Center, which is the home, you know, Master Sergeant Kramer, who gave you the command route, that's the home of the 9S100s where uh, they do their mission there. So, uh, fun fact about me, I am a girl dad, so I've got a daughter who's about to turn 25. She worked for the Council on Foreign Relations, formerly up in Manhattan at their office, now she's in D.C., real proud of her, I don't know where she gets those brands from, uh, probably her mom. I've got a daughter who's uh, five years old who goes to uh, school here in town and she's a, a dance and gymnastics person. So um, I was doing, uh, trying to do some little buns this morning. I actually had a hair tie on my hand as I was coming in here today. And we've got, you know, uh, at this age, as you can imagine I am, I've got a seven month old at the house. A uh, little girl who's kind of running the show. So that's a little bit about me. With that, Gee. Thank you, sir. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Bree Oliver, as Colonel Finlayson said, and I'm at the 17th Training Group. I am a career intel individual by trade as well. Uh, my group is an airborne cryptologic language analyst, uh, Russian, the question always comes up, but Russian is my area of expertise. I did a number of years as an interpreter, kind of the State Department doing nuclear arms control, non-proliferation, stuff like that with Russia back when we were a little bit more friendly with them than we are today. I was listening to NPR on the way here, and. Things are looking a little crazy, but I have job security, so it should be okay, right? Uh, I've been coming back and forth to Goodfellow since I think my first trip here was in, in 2003 uh, for the cryptologic training here um, as, as a student, and I've been coming back and forth ever since. You can't, you can't get away from it, really. Um, so I told you I did the interpreter gig. I, I flew a compass call mission, which is electronic warfare, so that's a com communications jamming platform at, out at Davis Monson. And then from here, I'm fresh off of five years, five, think about it, like a quarter of my career at the Pentagon, mm -hmm. um, working in career field management and, and doing just different things and on the air staff there with Lieutenant General first Jameson and then Lieutenant General O'Brien, who is the head of Air Force uh, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance and Cyber Effects Operations. Uh, I also brought my family here, and I'm a girl mom as well. Like I, I actually think that we're, we're girl parents and dance parents. I, sometimes I glitter on me and I don't want anyone to wonder where it came from. So it's like from children, it's from children, very innocent things, nothing crazy, no nighttime activities. <laughs> but I, uh, I really wanted to come back to, to good 
fellow. Uh, after kind of the kind of towards the end of my career, career I just said 20 years, and uh, be a part of what it is that, that we do here. So I think about like the training that we do at Goodfellow and across the wing out, out at our uh, sister group at the 517th Training Squadron out at the City of Monterey uh, at the language school there. You know, it's, it's kind of like the flying hours program. If you're in the Air Force and you've been around um, operational bases, like it never stops. You have to get it done. That's how training is. Like it doesn't stop. Like the graduates will keep coming from boot camp or BMT, whatever you're familiar with, with calling it. They keep coming and we have to keep training them. And you kind of have to have that super operational mindset. Some people think like, oh, you're going to go to Goodfellow, it's going to be sleepy. I know I was promised a break and I have not gotten a break. Uh, I definitely, it's, it's been one thing after another. So uh, that, that's, that's a really cool thing, right? Like we don't necessarily have a flight line that keeps us up, up and, and stressed, but we have a lot of other things. You're going to get exposed to a lot of different things that maybe you didn't expect coming to a training base because the obstacle is pretty high. The opportunities to meet senior leaders are, what would you say, sir, like every other week? I mean, yes. we, we have a, yes. a general office around this base super regularly because the community, the, the Air Force, I mean, today we have some Marine Corps visitors. I mean, the, the, the Army, the, the Space Force, they're super interested. The Coast Guard, the Navy, everybody's coming here to see what it is we're doing because it's that exciting. But that training, like I have learned very quickly, that training doesn't just happen within the training group itself. That, that training can't happen if the gates aren't running. The training can't happen if, if the, the DFAC isn't open. The training can't happen if the medical teams aren't able to handle sick call. So the amount of, of liaising we do across this base is, is amazing and it's pretty awesome because I, I really do feel like we're there for one another and we can pull together. And we had the opportunity to do that last year. I'm, I'm praying it doesn't happen. It's my first week on the job, we had this like terrible snowstorm. Yes, don't, Texas. don't wish that evil on us, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> but we got to see it and we got to see how the community came together to take care of not only the student population that lives on the base and we've got some out in the town, but how we took care of one another, making sure that, that we were okay. And I kind of liken the base a little bit to the feel of being overseas because you are a little bit isolated, but this is a gem of a place to be. San Angelo has pretty much, I mean, I came from DC. I, I mean, and I haven't really missed it, but if you've been in DC traffic, this is before COVID, you know why I haven't missed it, right? But but we, we do have a lot of things, maybe not as much variety, but, but the, the individual things are here. There's even wine bars downtown in yeah. San Angelo, Texas. That was not here when mm -hmm. I was I probably would have been interested when I was, yeah. anyway, neither here nor there. Um, but Graham, if you've been here before, Graham Central Station is closed, depending on how old you are, you don't understand that reference. Um, but, but we do have pretty interesting things to do in town. Uh, as far as your, your nightlife activities, restaurants, uh, bars, and, and things like that. And that's kind of my favorite thing uh, about this place is how much you wouldn't, every day I'm like, oh, I never would have thought there's like a homemade ice cream shop mm -hmm. downtown. Uh, and an interesting thing about me is that I am kind of building a dog pack and my plans after I retire are actually to be in San Angelo. And uh, my family and I are gonna start a therapy dog business um, with uh, Bernie's Mountain Dogs and Poodles, maybe even Bernie Doodles, that's a real thing, that wasn't really that was a real thing, it's a real breed. Um, but uh, they're really great breeds uh, for, for veterans that, that maybe need a companion for emotional support, and then also just to have in, in your life. They're good family dogs, and that's kind of what I want to do, and everyone's like, wow, really? So goodbye, Russia. I, I do want to go back, my retirement gift that I've asked my husband for, is a, a trip to Russia, not now, once again, not now. Um, maybe when tensions are a little bit lower, but I'd, I'd really love to go back there as a tourist. I uh, spent a lot of time there, kind of growing up in the military. So that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Well, a couple things to hit on there, but tiring in San Angelo, if you've been here before that, you know, that for a lot of people that wasn't a thing, but a big part of what we do here, raise your hand, you heard of the Skill Bridge program, what that is. So Skill Bridge is something that you can do either when you're separating or retiring, that allow you to uh, get uh, your three to six months, depending on your supervisor, some job experience in town. That program didn't exist when I was here before. We're doing great things because the community wants to get, not just your entry level, but some of our folks who are going to uh, retire as senior NCOs, that's field grade officers, so you can stay here. And the goal would be that you like it so much, that's what you want to do. So one of the nice things about being at this base is most people think Goodfellow Air Force Base, Intel, ISR professional. But there's a lot more going on that we train uh, here. We've got uh, Joint Coalition Forces. 
and we've got the DOD's fire academy. Got the opportunity when we had one of those two stars get the AATC commander come out, got to rappel over at the Garland Fire Academy, which was awesome. Haven't been to the confined space trainer, but I'm gonna start off as with our, not our fire academy, but our firefighters. So when our, uh, you or our, our good trainees are out there and they should get hurt or what have you, it's these guys who respond. I've got to spend a lot of time over at their firehouse and this basically, I love this job because even though I'm an intel officer, I don't need to do intel because we've got a, two training groups who do that. I am, hey, what's going on? What do the firefighters need? What do the permanent party folks need? I get to go down to finance. I get to go down to security forces and shoot that M18, which I think I'm kind of nice with. So, just so you know. So we are going to start over here, so sir, if you just jump up and, and just kick it off. Tell us a little about yourself. Uh, Justin Nations, I'm from San Angelo, and I've been firefighting for, uh, a firefighter in the Marine Corps, and then I came back here and decided to go back to firefighting. Awesome. So you are from San Angelo. I'm going to put you on the spot. We've got at least 60 to 70 taquerias in town. Where's your best breakfast taco or, or lunch Ooh, taco? Primo's on Chapman. Where's that? Primo's on Chapman. Primo's on Chapman. I've been to a lot of them, and they, they know this mug. That's why I go to the gym every day, but I'll have to hit that one up. Sir. Ron Eubanks. I'm from this area also. Uh, went through the Fire Academy back in 2007. Got stationed in South Dakota. Out of the Air Force, so yay. Nice. <laughs> Got tired of the cold, got out on the old field, and now I'm back here, so. Right on. You went over to Graham Central Station. I know you, oh, you got it. You knew what I was talking about, right? Yeah. That's, 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 that's why I was sitting over here shaking my head. Actually, two, two of our good chiefs, and one's retired, they, they met their spouses within like a week of being stationed at Graham Central Station. So. And they're still married. And they are. So, awesome, ma'am. Good morning, my name's Crystal. Um, actually just moved uh, to Abilene uh, about a, two months ago. Um, from Miami, Florida. I just came off six years with the Air Force Reserves on Homestead. Oh, nice. And I just, uh, I was with uh, the Naval Air Station Key West for about two years as a firefighter as well. So okay. I just transferred over, moved to Abilene with my significant other, okay. and then started working here and actually graduated from the Academy in 2016. So do you live here or do you still live in Abilene? I, I just moved to Abilene two months ago. Okay. In November, and, but I, I work here. So yeah. I just do the commute. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. So fun fact, our wing secretary, she lives in Sweetwater, which is right near uh, Abilene, and she drives every day listening to some audio tape. So welcome. We're glad to have you. Thank Man. you. towards the airport, you'll see our, uh, where she works out there. It's a great pool for family. My daughter had her fifth birthday out there. It was rock star. We've got uh, cabins out there. For a couple bucks, you can go be, learn how to be a uh, boat captain. Definitely hit up the rec camp. Uh, it's a good time. Sir? Good morning. I'm Terry Uh I'm in the LAS, so if y'all have any vehicle needs, you'll be coming to see us. Uh, I truck driver by trade. Came off the road in 19. Got remarried. My wife uh, we got started at ASU, so that's how we got here. And uh, it's a total change of pace from being on the road to coming in here and being home every night. Awesome. Enjoy it. Welcome. Hey, that's a good plug for Angelo State University. Angelo State University, we have things you'll hear about the Doolittle Scholars Program. If you're probably in the military, you've got between CCAF and uh, your curriculum and a bunch of credits. Angelo State, I would say, is they're regarded as the most military-friendly university out there. It does not hurt when the president is locally grown, San Angelo boy, retired three-star Lieutenant General Ronnie Hawkins. Angelo State University, uh, while you're here at the time, look into that. Use your government benefits. I can't tell you enough. I'm on the phone with not General Hawkins or some of his folks in his military affairs office um, at least two or three times a week, and she's probably more. So I would, that's a great plug and segue. Thanks for setting me up, sir. Tech Officer Justin McDaniel, uh, one of your repeat offenders, sir. I've been nice. here four or five different times. I'm wow. uh, 9S100, um, uh, the instructor out here at the Spencer Schoolhouse. Um, PCSing in from Yokota Air Base, Japan, where I traveled all over the Indo PACOM AOR. Uh, it 
doing anti commission the Air Force Technical Operations Center. Awesome. Did we trade you for Manny Campo? Didn't he just go to you for Did you um, guys swap? Did you high five? Kind of. Okay. He's, yeah, he's going out. He's going out there to be the section chief okay. at, at the detachment that I just left. So, so what's to. cool about it is for the job you do. What's the coolest place uh, that you got to go to out there? Coolest place? Yeah. Uh, probably Taipei. Taipei. And there's some of our 9S100s who've been out like to Antarctica or up in Alaska to, yes, to fix uh, parts, so awesome. Well, welcome home. Thank you. Why don't we go to this table right here, ma'am? I'm Amanda. I'm with Civil Engineering Squadron. Um, I previously worked with the commissary, though. I'm San Angelo native. I'm right. happy to get to Atlanta to San Angelo. Okay. I'm an ASU graduate um, last year. Graduated with public health in the midst of COVID, but I still don't work in healthcare. Um, <laughs> I also have a almost five year old who does gymnastics. She keeps me really where, where does she go for gymnastics? Uh, she goes to Contra That's where my daughter goes to. Big up, so right. But I know he said El Primo, but. Las Gallos also has. I've been there. All right, now I'm down to. Awesome. <laughs> so, so welcome, and that is what we like to have people local and tell your story. Um, you know, uh, I know our CE squadron, uh, Mr. Mill Rayoga, has an excellent program of uh, getting people from Angelo State to come kind of be interns here and then uh, stay on to be hired. So, welcome. Oh, one of my favorite MTOs. Hi, Sergeant Sergeant Blair Villa. Good morning. Um, I'm going to be attached to the 312 Fire Protection. Unit out here. I came from Baldwin Air Force Base. Um, I'm a civil engineer. I like train HVAC to be specific. Okay. Um, and like you, sir, I'm from El Paso. What high school? Texas, uh, Urban High School. Urban. Uh, I went to Austin. Okay. So yeah, yeah I live in the Northeast. That's yeah. where I, my parents are from. So and uh, prior to that, I was at McConnell and Shepherd. So we got contracted out. So um, looking forward to the next three years here from MCL. New experience. So I'm pretty excited. Um, well, so, so not too far from the house. Holloman here. Holloman was my first base back when they had F 117s. Holloman. If you get a chance, our Army uh, E9 Command Sergeant Major is an Urban High School grad. Uh, oh, is he? Sudan awesome. King, so we have to look him up. So. I'll make sure to reach out and let him know. Awesome. And our MTLs, I know you say you're a CE, but they do a little bit of everything. You know, part-time social worker and psychologist, you guys make it happen. So. I've been here several days and I'm starting to notice the tech. It's a lot different from what I'm used to doing as a civil engineer, so I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So and we may have to rely on your HVAC skills because it gets hot as I don't know what stuff breaks here. They're, they're already planning on it. Yes. <laughs> Awesome. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Hello, I'm um, Airman First Class Gonzalo Loaizo. Um, I'm going into the 17th Con. Okay. I'm um, Pipeline, so I came from Lackland Air Force Base. And uh, in fact, uh, talking about packs, I have a three year old Doberman, and I'm going to get another one from Dallas soon. Nice. Right. Three months. Cool. Where's home for you right now? Orlando, Florida. Nice. What high school did you go to? Uh, Cypress Creek. Okay, my wife used to teach high school at Dr. Phillips. Oh, Dr. Yeah. Welcome. How about you? Welcome, we're glad to have you. I was stationed at Wright Pack for Squadron Command. It's a great place to be from. Good morning, I'm Mark. Um, nurse by trade, so I'm over at the 17th Medical Group. Okay. Come from uh, Defense Health Headquarters up in Falls Church, Virginia, North okay. Virginia. So I definitely completely understand what you say about the traffic, pre-COVID and COVID traffic. Two, yeah, you're talking about two separate uh, sounds right there. A uh, quick fun fact uh, for me is that I was prior enlisted Navy many moons ago. I've been around this uh, military thing doing it for a while now, but uh, love, uh, lo love the whole aspect of the military and wouldn't trade it for anything. And uh, so I, I joke with my kids, you know, I started off as a barnacle scraper, and I actually did in the Navy, wow. and, uh, and, you know, crossed over to the blue and white stuff and, uh, and, and the nursing. Welcome. Hey, I'm going to throw a big pitch. If it wasn't for our medical group, we wouldn't have been able to fight through uh, COVID and keep that pipeline going and keep our uh, permanent party and our family safe. They're going through something right now. I forgot the what's called the Genesis rollout. So if you're old school and you remember having to carry your, your records with you and uh, things not following you and uh, the whole Genesis rollout, I know they're doing that this Saturday. So I'm going to go take a little time and go over and thank them for that. So hopefully it's going to make all this a lot more transparent. So welcome. Sure. Good 
does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, keep that cold weather up in Colorado, and I will tell you, Silver is a, a sore spot. So as I told you, a lot's changed since you've been here. If you've been here before, our Silver, we're, we're still doing some work to try and uh, blow that up and, and bring that up to the, the current mission level. But we're glad to have you. Defender. How's it going? I'm Sarah McCampbell. Uh, started in 15 at Ellsworth, South Dakota. Ellsworth is another Ellsworth person over here. So you <laughs> just give me the little two of this came down. Yeah, so you know already know about that negative temperatures. Um, at, uh, from 19 to 21, I was in Tyndall, at, uh, Florida. I just moved here, born and raised in Clean, Texas. So okay. I'm a Texas native. I thought you were in the gate before. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Was, we were at a couple of yeah. uh, times together. Yeah. Um, and then special thing about me is I can play about any sport that's a uh, I never really like tennis, but I can play about any sport there is. Intramural volleyball. Yeah, intramural volleyball is coming up and I know a bunch of the, the defenders, they, they play a little bit of everything and there's great intramurals in town too. So awesome. Okay. Welcome, thank you very much. Thank you. How you doing? Uh, Staff Sergeant Austin Bus, uh, came from Shaw. Okay. Prior. Uh, I've been here for a few years and I've been working in There's a lot of great Facebook groups, including our good fellow uh, uh, spouses. Please sign up for that. That has everything from where can I get a good uh, military friendly uh, kennel for when you go TDY. I got a place, um, Country Club for Dogs, where we take dogs. Excellent. They do a great military discount. If you got all the time, where can I go get my hair cut correct? You can ask that on me. Where is a good place for uh, kids' gymnastics? Hey, um, got to get the kids in school. I need to go see a pediatrician. And as the med group will tell you all, we have our own pediatrician on base now who there's appointments for. But if you do go in town and you want to know, hey, what's the best pediatrician so I can get X, Y, Z, you can ask those questions on those forums. There's a bunch of them. Our Airmen and Family Readiness Center, by far the best I've seen, heavily engaged. Whatever you're trying to do, whether it's, hey, you want to come here and get some investments going. Um, you want to get uh, professional development. There's awesome opportunities. I've already hit Angelo State University. Uh, just a little bit about the town. If you guys have uh, some 
the rank and some time in. You've probably been all over. I can tell you, maybe after September 11th, everybody was hands around the military was friendly. This town is, if you could say it's close to over the top as far as loving the military. It's not a day that goes by. I don't get a text, as I mentioned, from the annual state president of the military affairs people. Uh, we might be expecting a little bit of weather coming up, so on the text with the uh, school superintendent. Likewise, the people are having probably have an excellent resource in our school liaison on base, Ms. Teresa Goodwin. If you kid, uh, you want to know public or private schools, special needs, we can make that happen for you. Very forthright, very uh, outgoing. Uh, the base activities, whether you want to do the uh, paint and sip over here at the uh, Skills Auto Hop Center, you want to do the intramurals, you're trying to get your education on, lots of opportunities. Outside the gate, uh, as Chief mentioned, we've got a winery in Cristobal, lots of good barbecue, and if you're not afraid to put a few miles on the vehicle, you could be San Antonio, Dallas, El Paso pretty easily. I, I'll tell you, after being here for a year and a half, I kind of get spoiled. I call my new base and I'm like, you still go hang out with the mayor and, and folks like that on a weekly basis just to, to get things done and like, um, no, no we don't. It's not a day that goes by you walk through a BS. Yes, a lot of it is good for your younger folks, our, our students, there's a lot of computer stuff in there, but it's the only refurbished BX uh, uh, here recently. As the civic leaders are here and we're cutting the ribbon and we're saying, hey, this is great, let's take some pictures. Now let's ask me, hey, Cobra, what's next? What do we name next for the people of Goodfellow? That doesn't happen anywhere I've been to. So I would tell you, uh, get out, get involved, and this is definitely a place that you may want to either come back to or retire. Chief, what do you got? I mean, honestly, I, I think this building, part of this building was even built through some grants from the state of Texas, the city of San Angelo, our yeah. civic leaders, and then the military will come and cost a little bit of money up too. So it's not just that they like us and, and they, and they want to hang out with us on the weekends, it's that, that they're willing to do the work. So when you're out and about, and I know that we're all probably old enough to protect that relationship and understand that, but just carry that with you, that, that we are all part of that important relationship that we have with our community leaders. And, and represent that. Once again, I know we're all old enough that we shouldn't have to say that, but remember all the things that they do for the base. We can walk around and point to, to different buildings and, and things like that. And we'll all get probably get the opportunity to be around them because they come to the squadrons, they come on tours, they come and check things out uh, because they care and they want to think about how can maybe resources that they have access to can, can improve lives here on the squadron. And that's, that's pretty epic uh, for sure. Like I said, putting the money where the mouth is goes a long way. You know, all the way up to our local congressman, August Fluger, was one of my freshmen at the Air Force Academy. So uh, he's here now, a former uh, Air Force F-22 pilot. He's all text me, hey, well, what, what do you need, we need for this? Let's get it after a new dorm. What do we need for the folks? Uh, what do the families need to make them happier? So I, I can't say enough about the local community. And eyes are on here. We have, uh, in March, the uh, four-star who leads the National Security Agency, U.S. Cybercom, General Matasoni, coming out to see us. Um, at some point, likely, uh, the Secretary of the Air Force has mentioned interest and maybe the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, uh, Joanne Bass, was just out here with uh, Shirt One because she was a former command chief here. So uh, we get a lot of visitors that come out here, but the goal is, hey, a lot of it is, one, what can we do for the members and their families? But this is what right looks like. Uh, chief Joe Bass uh, sent a note back on Facebook and said, hey, I'm bringing the team out because I want some of the other bases and chiefs to know what Wright looks like as far as partnering with your community because she was here. So I, I, I'm very proud of that. So what I will tell you is I don't come to one of these without getting some homework. So for some of our folks who are repeat, repeat offenders or some folks who are civilians, what would you like to see better? Uh, one we are working on, if you were here, remember, um, it's an LRS warehouse now, but remember we had a permanent party gym so I will tell you, I love getting games in with the students because I like seeing them, but at the same time, you know, they're on, they're on their cell phones in the morning and, and taking up my, you know, when I'm trying to get my sweat on. We are trying to look into getting another pump party gym. Um, so that's one thing we are working on. Um, yeah, so with that, what, what can we do for you guys and your families? Let them take notes. You, you look like you had a question there. Get ready. <laughs> party <laughs> tears. That's how they are. They are. Bombs on target all the time. Mm -hmm. Anything. Anything that you're seeing, any hope that you need? Sir. I have a question for the locals here. I haven't found any good barbecue down here. Coopers and Cristobal. Coopers and Cristobal. Yeah. I, I, would have to, I would have to double down on that. Yeah. I, I like the atmosphere, but that wouldn't. 
barbecue wouldn't have point that big. So uh, if you catch it early, uh, bodacious over there on, on Sherwood's good. And a little known fact, they do uh, the next day, if you get there by lunch, they keep a slab of ribs, like they call the day old ribs. Take those bad boys, uh, half price them in the air fryer, and that, that's lunchtime right there. So Appreciate that's it. one thing I don't mess around with my barbecue. When I was in Dayton <laughs> City Barbecue, they knew this mug. Again, that's why I work out seven days a week. For folks with families, any questions, anything that uh, we could be doing better, anything you need, because all the resources are here. If I can't do it, Chief can't do it, our good folks from the Airman and Family Readiness Center can help you get those resources. Again, very approachable. If you see me out, uh, whether it's at the BX, usually the commissary and the uh, pharmacy line where the retirees will hit me up, and believe me, they got no, no qualms about telling me what they need that can be better. So we are looking to do uh, some good events for the retirees and always our local populace. Uh, there's great activities coming up. You will see things advertised not only on our public affairs uh, Facebook page, but also our four support squadron. Everything's open to everyone. Some of that stuff may be like the welcome back party. Yes, it's students welcome back, but that's for you guys too. Right in this very building, we had a mechanical pool. We had free food outside. We had bouncy house, climbing wall, and all that. That is for uh, the folks here for you to come out, bring the family, and do things on the cheap. We have a plan coming up, uh, what we call a food truck rodeo. Again, getting some of those local uh, barbecue, there's popcorn, there's tacos, just to come on base. And again, for our, our people who live in Building 700, we had Building 700 dwellers, anybody? anybody you live in Building 700 or in town? So that's for them, it's for the students, it's for the permanent party. Again, things you want. Super Bowl parties, we're doing all those things. Again, this uh, for you folks out there. I'm, I, another plug for our, uh, our PO professionals in the back public affairs, they're the ones who will monitor uh, a lot of the Facebook pages. So when you come up and say, hey, I tried to go check in, and I heard this at the med group, that my kid can't get in or I can't get seen, they're gonna let me know, uh, or the med group commander or the uh, senior enlisted leader, we're gonna engage. So big props to public affairs, because everything we do, they're, they're gonna pump it up for you and let you know what's going on, not only on base, but in the local community. Any final spirits or anything? Again, Any questions, yeah, go ahead. Questions, though, anything else? For the chief? I'll tell you what, it is my honor, as much as we uh, love uh, doing the new BNT welcome for the tech trainees on Tuesday, you guys are the ones on the front line of what they see, uh, whether it's at the front gate, whether they're checking in at the mid clinic. Obviously, our MTLs, our fire professionals, our folks out at the rec camp, you guys are the face of what we see. So keeping you and your families happy is a priority because you're going to be here for a while and you're going to tell your friends. So again, it's my pleasure to welcome you here and um, thank you very much for what you do. All right, folks. Let's go down. Thank you.
it's going to be in this format. Um, it, it's very, it like gets cut off if I do it in the other format. So um, it'll just look like that. So. Hello and welcome to this edition of the 17th Training Wing Safety Course. The video you are about to watch is required by AFI 91-207. It will highlight safety information specific to Goodfellow Air Force Base and the to explore that option and you're still at Goodfellow, 
motorcycle safety course. Um, <laughs> the other thing too is um, the golf carts. You know, we have a lot of golf carts riding around, driving around here, so be cautious of uh, the golf carts. Um, so anything else about road safety that you guys feel we need to cover? Watch the deer. Yes, yes, the deer. Thank you. Um, so, how everybody, how long have, who's been here for longer than a month? Okay, why weren't you guys in the newcomers last month? Congress. Oh, okay. All right, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so, one, one big thing at this base is there are a lot of deer that just like to uh, just roam and they don't really care about the vehicles. So, um, just being cautious of the deer around here. Um, so, I wish I could reiterate what was what is all on this video. I've only watched it once, um, and that was last month. So, but um, we will. So this was supposed to take about ten minutes. So I believe our emergency. I'm going to come over to you. Sorry, my baby bubble. Emergency management will be here. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, bear with me today, because um, we'll, I'll try to fill in some, some gaps here and there. Um, so, we'll, there, there might be a little bit of time where you guys can just mingle amongst yourselves, um, or else we can, we can talk about the Airmen and Family Readiness Center, actually. So, some of you are, this is your first base, correct? Raise your hand if this is your first base. Okay. Second base. Third base, all right, okay. Um, so who knows what the Airmen and Family Readiness Center is? Raise your hands. What is it? Because you said you're trying to become more of an extrovert, so. <laughs> the Airmen and Family Readiness Center is the Airmen and Family Readiness Center. <laughs> 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 so I'm just with the Airmen and Family Readiness Center. So I'm the Airmen and Family Readiness Center. Um, caters to military personnel, families, and the personnel we have with the children. Uh, activities, deployers as well. Um, they used to also put on certain um, events. Because uh, a lot of people when you think like outdoor rec does a lot of things and so does that kind of rec center. There's like some cooking classes and uh, some craft uh, classes and stuff like that. Um, one thing I did uh, as a supervisor, uh, I'm financially uh, competent, but I will always still take my airmen to the airmen and to do a budget as well. And also the airmen and airmen and airmen center has so much information. A lot of resources out there that can actually help accommodate people that have been uh, in their lives or go through their lives as well. Um, it's a very, very, very outstanding agency. Uh, not only have I used it in the past, but also helped them out as well. And for those of you who are supervisors, please take your airmen to. So uh, if you guys feel the need that you want the those resources, please come on by. You don't have to. I mean, you can just come. We also have our Air Force aides, so if there's ever ta a time where an emergency comes up, there's a death in the family, and you guys need to go on emergency leave, um, we are able to assist with like grants there, loans, um, if that does happen, which I hope it doesn't, but um, don't buy your tickets yet. You can come to the Airmen and Family Readiness Center first so that we can assist you with that. If you buy your tickets and then you want to get reimbursed, we won't be able to assist with the reimbursement. So. Um, we have a lot of options for military spouses. If you follow our page, the Air, Airmen and Family Readiness Goodfellow page on Facebook, um, our social media crew is very on top of uh, everything that we have to offer um, as far as classes, um, our like workshops. So please, you know, if you guys want to take out your phones right now and go and follow like Airmen and Family Readiness Center, feel free to. All right, by the end of the day, you can. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Um, you know, and then we also have uh, uh, employment options. If your spouses need employment, come to us. Uh, we have individual, we can help you guys there. Um, building a resume, filling out job applications, searching for jobs. So we have all of those resources as well. Um, we have the, if you, if you deploy, we have pre-deployment briefings and then also bringing in like the families when uh, the mem military members are deployed. So um, 
that's just kind of, we'll kind of go over everything with the Airmen and Family Readiness Center, but I felt like this was a good time since, you know, we don't want to watch a safety video, video right now. So. That awesome safety video. <laughs> so I'm Sergeant West. I'm from the Emergency Management Flight here on base. Uh, we deal with everything. We deal with everything from disaster preparedness to running the emergency operating center to uh, live response for hazmat incidents, and then of course uh, we're the lovely seabird instructors for whenever y'all come through and get your seabird training. Yes. Anybody been to Korea? Y'all know all the answers already for Seaburn. <laughs> uh, this isn't a Seaburn brief, fortunate enough for y'all. We're just going to go over the base emergency preparedness orientation. It's really quick. I'll be out of here. How do y'all say in five minutes? Let's see if I can figure out how to use So these are our topics, notification procedures, weather and natural disasters, um, the preparedness itself, the different types of sheltering. There's going to be three different types. And then uh, last of the lockdown, kind of in the process, the same as the sheltering. So straight into it, these are your four main notification styles. Uh, ad hoc is extremely important on this space. That's how you get all your relevant info for any sort of exercise, um, especially for what's about to happen potentially Thursday morning. We have the freeze occurring with potential sleet and or snow. Um, if you're not getting your ad hocs properly, you're not gonna know not to come to work. Uh, so be aware. Uh, the worst thing you can do is show up to work and basically shut down. Uh, it's not, not going to be a good day. Second is going to be your email. Uh, pretty typical. Giant voice, kind of iffy here. Works most of the time. Uh, the clearance or the clarity, I should say, isn't always the best depending on where you are on the installation. And lastly, is iPause, which is actually a FEMA ran. We basically get into that licensing, and that is more or less like a um, child abduction warning. It's not that. This is for emergency notification for the same concept. So no matter where you are, a relative location, doesn't matter if you go on leave to Houston or something like that, they can send out uh, within a radius of a certain area, you get that child abduction alert. This is the same thing. So if you get something from iPods, it is real world. They don't use that for exercises at all. Tornado warning uh, with the cancellation and the all clear. We'll dig into that. I hate these slides. Um, so a watch, a little bit different from a warning. A watch is when conditions are favorable, when you start to see the funneling, when you start to see the dark clouds, stuff like that. A warning is whenever it's actually imminent or occurring. So it's about to take place or it's already taking place. Uh, those are, when you hear that on, on the giant voice, you get that on ad hoc, whether it's a watch or the money, just trying to know the difference there. Uh, shelter during that tornado, don't, don't go outside taking videos, I know that's kind of cool, but uh, please shelter your home down your day. A big one out here is thunderstorms, just like most other relevant locations. With a thunderstorm, you're dealing with lightning. Uh, same thing, stay indoors. There's no point in, in going outside the thunderstorm. Take a break inside. You also have high winds and hail damage. Yes, out here in central west Texas, we do get hail. We had a hail storm pretty quickly after I got here last February. I'd say like a week after I got here. Uh, luckily, no damage to where I live, but I want to say like the southwest side of town got a little bit of health damage to their vehicles and roof structures, things like that. Uh, make sure you have insurance if you're a homeowner. Make sure that insurance covers health damage. Same thing for car owners. Here's some more tornado info. Uh, more specifically, the April through June time frame, that's when it's most likely to occur. Uh, brush up on what you should be doing during those tornadoes. That three to five minute steady tone is what they're going to blast over base. So steady is going to be for anything storm, and when it's wavering up and down, that's war related, which hopefully we never hear uh, states up. Floods are, are uh, prudent in this area because of the drainage issues with San Angelo, because it's a very old town. Um, flood water can increase very rapidly in certain areas and flash flood a certain area. 
uh, especially the low-lying areas of Kirkman, San Angelo, and the city. Uh, don't try and, and cross it. Six inches of water is all it takes to uh, wash a car away. So don't try and cross it in your vehicle if you can avoid it. Any questions so far on any of this? Please feel free. Yes, sir. Uh, what are the big areas to avoid in town? All of us. <laughs> anything well lying so there's a, a, a few main streets, anything that's considered downtown. If you feel like you're downtown, you're in a potential flash flood area. Um, yeah, that's that's the gist of it. And honestly, it can happen anywhere depending upon the amount of water falling in that area. But you can kind of see uh, when you're galloping around this beautiful city, uh, you can kind of see like the issues that lie with drainage because there is no drainage on the side of the road. It's, it's literally just roads and bushes. There's there's nothing underneath. It all just washes on the road. Cool. This is just a, a quick example of emergency supplies. I recommend keeping emergency supplies in your vehicle uh, and also having a kit at your house. A big one there for, for most people is going to be food and water, not only for yourself, but for your family members, especially those with babies. Make sure you have diapers, formula if needed, things like that. It's something that gets overlooked very easily. Uh, no one really likes to prepare for worst case scenarios, but uh, it sucks to suck when you're in those sort of situations, right? Winter weather, which is about, like I said, it's about to hit us. Uh, hopefully it's not too bad like last February. Last February, it affected this surrounding area and multiple surrounding areas in West Texas. I don't know if y'all heard about our power grid shut down. Uh, stay tight. Great. Uh, with that, uh, big one, black ice. So make sure your vehicles are roadworthy. Tread depth on your tires. Keep a full fuel tank. Uh, fuel, full fuel tanks prevent condensation inside the fuel tank, which that's going to be water getting into your engine system. You don't want that to happen. So try and stay cool, uh, especially during winter months. We have a Goodfellow Air Force Base website and Facebook that PA runs. That's going to issue a lot of warnings and stuff like that. Sometimes they're going to give the heads up like, hey, only essential personnel are showing up to, to, to base today, which is more likely going to be a CE folks and security forces. Sorry for you guys. Um, and a big one is layers, right? So anybody that's from the South doesn't really uh, understand. If you haven't seen the rest of the world, they don't understand layering clothing. They just take one big heavy jacket and you're good to go. You want to build up the layers, that's going to keep you warmer. Any questions on weather? Any questions at all so far? After winter time, it's Texas, so it's going to get hot. It's going to get really, really hot. Um, pay attention to your hydration. Kind of weird, but pay attention to your ear, right? That's going to tell you whether or not you're hydrated or not. Um, it's up to you. People can't force feed you water. Um, maybe unless you're a trainee, then you get your water breaks kind of thing, which you're forced to drink. That average high in our summer months is 95, which is no joke, so I'm not going to beat that to death. Just make sure you're paying attention to yourself and all those around you, especially if you're doing anything outside, outside work. Here's our sheltering real quickly. So you have storm sheltering. That's uh, anything that's going to be considered a natural event, thunderstorm, tornadoes. It's going to be your innermost room. Your facility manager of whatever building you're attached to is going to have this info as well. And we send this stuff out pretty much on a weekly basis to all the units that should be getting uh, pushed out from your emergency management representatives. The next one is going to be shelter in place. This is a man-made hazard. Think about a chlorine spill on base, which we have had over at the pool. Um, for this one, it's a little bit different. You're going to want to go to the most upper level of the building. That's to get away from the dense chemical that might be outside trying to seep indoors, right? And that all has to do with affecting the oxygen level. You want to get as high as you can so you keep getting good oxygen. Um, your facility manager and or if you know how, can shut off the HVAC system and that will prevent the bad air from coming into the building. Lastly, the active shooter. I know we all go through this more times than we would like to. It's a very important thing. Also think about the base that you're on and the things that we deal with on this base. So lockdown, lockdown, lockdown is a typical active shooter warning. Primarily, you're gonna wanna get away from the shooter. Secondarily, you're gonna wanna barricade yourself inside of a room, hide and stay quiet kind of thing. And last resort, you're gonna fight. If you do have to fight, make sure you pretty much give it your all. Um, get as many people as you can together in that sort of incident. Along with the active shooter, um, there's also a classified emergency, I say classified, not that type of classified. It is classified as an emergency incident. 
It's been added to the terminology, but it's pretty much anything other than a gun. So a vehicle, a mass stabbing, uh, somebody you know is trying to run over a bunch of a bunch of trainees walking around kind of thing. That's still going to be that lockdown lockdown aspect, but it's just going to be called the emergency incident terminology aspect. This is our info. That comm number will go directly to our office. Somebody in my office is going to pick up as long as we're there. Uh, any other questions at all? Good. All right, thank you for your time. So I wanted to give you just a quick overview for those of you who are coming into the training group, uh, what the other squadrons do, but for those of you who are here in support of the training mission, uh, just give you an idea of what we do here. Uh, so with that, over, normally there's a thing there, there's not a thing there. Uh, so overall, we are developing, training, inspiring our intelligence professionals and our firefighter professionals. So every Air Force Intel person comes through here uh, additionally, every DOD firefighter comes through here for some, some level of training or another, plus a lot of joint uh, intelligence training missions as well. So the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the, you've got a couple of Coast Guard, and of course the uh, Space Force. So a lot of intelligence training going on here. Uh, like I said, all of the Air Force training, Air Force signal training, and all the firefighter training is going on here. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to get back to normal. We're still dealing with COVID. Uh, so we're still doing some at home, or not at home, but uh, like uh, training in the uh, in the dorm rooms and stuff. But unfortunately, as you can imagine, some of the intelligence training is kind of classified, so you can't really do that in the dorm room. And then firefighter training, of course, you can't really. I mean, you just turn on the sink and spray all you can't. I don't know, it doesn't really work. So we continue to struggle, not struggle. We continue to work through the challenges of uh, of the COVID. But we're getting it done. We have not shut down training yet. Uh, we continue to press forward and we're making. We have not shut down training yet. Uh, we continue to press forward and we're making. They're responsible for exactly that. They're the, the support. So for those of you who are coming in, you're going to go to the TRIS in order to uh, get your base instructor certification. This is where we do big training. Uh, we also do uh, CCAF accreditation. They do registrar stuff. 
They do a lot of the comm support uh, for the high side networks that we have. Uh, they produce a lot of graphics. They produce a lot of uh, training materials for us. So basically anything that is not directly training outside of the training instructors uh, is done by the TRIS. So they are, they are the support backbone to what the training group does. Oh, also really cool, uh, they're responsible for the in in international training. So you may see a few uh, foreign intelligence officers here, uh, and they come through here. They're supported by the TRIS. We have a special office dedicated just to support them. So when you see a foreign officer here, that's what they're doing. 312 is a really interesting squadron because they're the firefighter squadron, firefighter training squadron, and everything from right off the bus at basic training, learning how that initial skills, all the way through all the advanced training. So if you're a fire chief, uh, you will go through training here. Additionally, the 312 is responsible for SPINSTRA, Special Instruments Training. Uh, that is the technical applications. Basically what they do, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but broadly speaking, they're responsible for maintaining all of the equipment that we use for nuclear mon nuclear monitoring. Okay, so there's, there's all kinds of crazy stuff out there, and they are responsible for making sure that that stuff works. They're also getting into data analytics. So they're, they're really the, kind of the big brains of the operation. They're doing a lot of great things going there. Um, again, with firefighter training, every DOD firefighter is probably going to come through here and get some sort of training, whether it's civilian, whether it's military. The 313th is the newest training squadron. They're responsible for all the advanced courses, all the advanced intelligence courses that the Air Force has. So things like the Majors Levels course or the Master Sergeant Senior, senior NCO level uh, advanced courses. Uh, they also do some advanced targeting courses. They do, uh, let's see, what else? Yeah, pretty much everything. So they are, they're responsible for any of the additional training. So they do not do the AFSC specific training, uh, but all the advanced intelligence training that the Air Force needs has now been handled by the, uh, by the 313. The 315th is responsible for all the intelligence officer training, as well as the imagery intelligence training, targeting intelligence training, and finally the uh, but want to know, that's the enlisted analyst course. So this is, they are doing nothing but fundamentals training. So if you're an intelligence professional that's not a civilian person, you are graduating from here and getting that initial AFSC. So this is the largest squadron. At any given point, uh, over 1,200 members in the squadron that include students and staff. So it is large and it is very robust, uh, but this is the key to intelligence training here for the Air Force. And then finally, the 316th is responsible for signals intelligence training, not just for the Air Force, but for the Army, the Navy, and the Marines as well. What is signals intelligence? That's basically listening to bad guys, uh, figuring out what they're doing, or maybe looking at radar scopes to figure out what's being turned on or turned off. Um, it's really interesting because these are the folks who go through uh, a year or more of uh, language training. A lot of these folks go through uh, language training at Monterey, which is also part of the 17 training wing. So Monterey, they go through all the language training to listen, to learn how to listen to what the bad guys are saying. And then, then we teach them actually what it all means. So you learn basic Russian, you learn how to speak Russian, well then you come here and learn how the Russian military operates. So, and they also do the other sequels intelligence uh, training, so figuring out what's talking to what and what fits into what. Uh, they're also getting into cyber as well. This is where some of our cyber intelligence training is going on. They're not full on cyber analysts, uh, but they do cyber network analysis. It's, it's a really weird fine line, but it's there. So like I said, we continue to normalize and standardize what we're doing uh, within the training group, within the training squadron. It's been challenging over the last several years, but we're making it happen. Um, we are interested in making this a, a, an assignment of choice for folks. We want the best instructors to come here. We want the best support to be here for us, because this is important. This is where it's all happening. This is where we are making sure that those firefighters know how to come and get you out of a building and treat you in the event of an emergency. We're making sure that those targeteers are putting the right bombs on the right targets. We're making sure that those analysts are coming up with the right information. Because frankly, uh, I just I came from a signals intelligence squadron uh, two assignments ago, and I'm walking up and talking to a senior airman and I say, hey, what are you doing? And they say, oh, this is the report that I'm doing that goes into presidential daily briefing. So I have a senior airman, I have a senior airman 
who was creating information that's going up to the President of the United States. And it all started here. That's why it's very critical, it's very important what we're trying to do. Uh, we're continuing to try to build up the, uh, build up the infrastructure for us. These, the buildings down here, uh, you'll see they're older. They're uh, all built in the 80s, and some of them are definitely showing their wear and tear and age. Um, but we're continuing to try to do what we can to improve life for the students, life for the instructors, because it can be very stressful. I mean, there are some long days, uh, there are some challenges, but we want to do that. For our NTLs as well, that's a whole different set of challenges, making sure that you guys are helping prepare these, keep them as airmen and train them up as airmen. Very critical piece of that. Um, I'm trying to think, I won't read all the other issues up there, but we're still making it work. Uh, but a lot of challenges ahead. But we're excited, and I'm excited to have you guys here. So not only my instructors, but my support folks. Um, you guys are absolutely critical to what we're doing here because if we can't, uh, you know, if our comms aren't working, uh, if we're not protected on the base, I'm going to apologize to my security forces guys right now. We're constantly setting off alarms. I'm sorry, it, it just is. What it is. That's what I look at the blotter every day. Oh, the alarm set off. Oh, the alarm set off. So sorry, I apologize. Um, but every, everybody here has a critical piece to doing, uh, to helping support the training mission. Um, because we have to get those airmen out there and out into the field uh, to take care of what we do. So with that, um, I know I'm breezing that really quickly, but I didn't want to get into too much detail, but more than happy to answer questions for you. What questions do you have for me? None. I told you everything you need to know here at Good Girl. So this is actually my, well, technically my fourth time back here, twice as a student, uh, and then one time previously as a staff member. So I've been here for a, a little bit. Any questions about your fellow stuff in general, or any concerns that you may have about anything? No? Okay. Well, if you change your mind and you have any questions, please let me know. Um, we're, like I said, on the group staff, we're here to help you guys um, and help you help us. So if you have any questions, anything comes up later on, please let me know. But again, welcome. Thank you guys for being here. I'm excited about working with you and uh, making the transition happen. Thanks. Our next briefer should be here in about six minutes. So if you guys have not filled out the paperwork or the, the yeah, paperwork, please do so. Um, I just want to also confirm that everybody that everybody has the form that says good fellow Air Force Base uh, with the cross on the bottom. I just out on the bottom. Show of hands if you do not have that form.
I'm Teresa Goodwin, and I'm the school liaison, but the first thing I'm going to talk to you today about is the Child and Youth Programs, um, CYP, as it's affectionately known. And um, here at Goodfellow, we operate three buildings, school age, CDC, and youth center. We do have family child care, but currently we have no family child care home, so you'll see a little bit more um, as we talk about it. So, you know everybody has a mission statement for everything, so our mission, pretty much, I don't want to read everything to you all, because it's better, but quality, accredited, nationally and state, DOD certified, Texas Rising Star, affordable child care for families. Six weeks to 18 years. So each program has their own requirements and you're gonna see there as we, as we keep going um, for ages and how you can get enrolled into the programs. So care request. The biggest thing, whether you're coming in, going out, whether you have people coming in, you're sponsoring, militarychildcare.com. That is a, a worldwide database set for you to be able to enroll in programs prior to being there. That ensures your wait list, that you're on there, keep going in there and updating it. Sometimes the .mil addresses won't get the notifications like a Gmail or a Yahoo or, or a Hotmail. So make sure that you have those alternate emails in there so that you're getting the notifications. Prior to arrival, update, show that you're here. Same thing like if you're on the waiting list for your spouse that's having a child. Once you get to that nine month mark, make sure you're on that wait list. Once you deliver, go in and update so that it shows and automatically moves you up because in the CDC, you can start as early as six weeks age. Okay. Um, again, CDC, six weeks to five years. A lot of people don't realize that the CDC Child Development Center actually operates on a curriculum. So just like the schools would, you know, public, private, they operate off of a curriculum that's called M, and it's actually implemented from birth all the way up until five years age until they go into school. It has kindergarten readiness, transition supports. We actually have an embedded M flag that's into the child and youth program, so they visit all three buildings. Um, of course, CDC is the highest populated building, most children enrolled, um, so they do spend their time a lot there, um, but they can assist with various aspects of, of growth and development. Um, maybe you have a toddler. Maybe that toddler has picked up a nasty habit of fighting. That implant can go in there and help in observing kind of give you tips and tricks on what to do. Not only that, make it consistent across the board and work with those teachers in those classrooms to curtail and end that, that, that habit sometimes that kids pick up. <laughs> school age, that's our before and after school care. They follow SAISD, St. Angelo Independent School District's school year calendar. So during the times that, that there's a half day or a break period, the school age program is gonna operate and be open for your children then, okay? They also do busing to and from school. So in the before care, they have busing to certain heavy military impacted campuses and within SAISD. Um, so they again, accredited operate off of curriculum. They also implement Boys and Girls Club curriculum, 4-H curriculum, um, and YMCA curriculum. So they'll have certain clubs, certain camps that are generated to those curriculums to be able to support your students' needs, whatever they are. Um, and then we have youth center. So youth programs, they can go over there as early as nine years old, so nine to 18. It's not to be confused with before and after, not child care, it's more of an outlet for them to be able to meet other children their age, participate in programming, do things to help unify the base, the community, um, return on investment, be community leaders that, that they're destined to be. Um, they also program again, same thing, BGCA, YMCA, 4-H, um, and all their volunteer opportunities. Um, so they, they're, they're, they do busing as well, um, because some of those nine-year-olds will be on those same buses that go to the school age building as well. Oh, and they do, sorry, they do have a monthly enrollment fee of 20 bucks. So $20 a month, you can't beat that for hours upon hours of entertainment for them. <laughs> um, and then FCC, so like I said, currently we have zero providers. 
A lot of families don't understand or realize that this, if, if you have a spouse that wants to stay at home with your kids, this is an excellent mobile career opportunity for your spouse to make a little bit of money and be able to stay home with their kids. I've had families that um, had chose to do this and do uh, extended, 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 sorry, extended childcare. Um, and maybe they offer it Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Maybe they do before and after school care. And then they're home with their own children during that day period where maybe their older kids are at school. Um, I've had people do it all day, every day, wrap around 24 seven. Um, it is a, an excellent way for a spouse to make some income and still be able to stay at home and do what they want to do. Um, credited, training, tax write-off, it, it, it's a great opportunity for families. Um, so if you have any questions or you want more information or you know of somebody that may want information, Ms. Tasha is our Child and Youth um, School Age and Youth Center Training Curriculum Specialist. She's the point of contact for that. She also handles respite care. So if you have a family that's, or if you are a family that's EFMP and you qualify under respite care, she can hook you up with a provider in the community that's already established in doing this for respite care only. Okay. Um, these are all your points of contact. <laughs> so these, this is your CDC, your school age, your youth programs, and FCC. Um, the DAF Child and Youth website is a great website. It gives you a lot of different insight into the programs. Air Force wide, um, it's not generally specific, so if you want generally specific, you gotta go to the Go Goodfellow website and it'll break down our programs here at Goodfellow, um, the bus and transportation, which schools they go to. Um, so the, these are great points of contact. And literally, if you drive straight down the street, almost all the way down, the CDC and the Youth Center sit kind of in the same parking lot and the school age is the very last building all the way down. Do you guys have any questions? Okay, sorry, I kind of talk fast, so. <laughs> now I'm gonna talk to you about school liaison. How many of you PCS with children? School age children, let's say that. Okay, perfect. How many of you know what a school liaison is? Ah! Student-focused, partnership-driven. Our, our, mission, um, our mission is to generate real-time solutions for the military impacted family, ensuring seamless transitions from one state to another, from one country to another, from one base to another, making sure that your student doesn't lose or have any learning gaps and make sure that they get into the programs and the schools that, that they need. Um, we're that boots on the ground subject matter experts for our local education, but then we also work in partnership with our other affiliates, other school liaisons for other services because we do service the total force. Um, again, real time information. Really, really focus on that real time information. As, as we know and have seen the past few years, um, they go crazy. <laughs> Education is one of those very fluid things that is continuously changing. What happened a minute ago is going to be different from five minutes from now um, because they are just having to react to a lot of different things. So this lens of command teams, educators, community stakeholders, and the school liaison really the glue that kind of holds that together and that conduit to speak education to the military and military to the educators because a lot of times we have certain acronyms and they have certain acronyms and it just, it, you know, we are that conduit to help make sure that, that everyone is on the same page and understands, okay? Um, okay. Cross-functional collaboration, um, again, we are the pulse of that education and we, we speak that education language, so we are that continuity that you'll find from base to base. We are a total force and we do work towards a purple community. So how many knows what a purple community is? That, that is servicing all branches of service. Um, making sure that all families, all students that are transitioning have the support that they need. 
um, and again, making those proactive purchases. Um, we are very proactive and we work kind of outside of the box and we really look and focus on a lot of best practices. So maybe they're doing something in a school district that could be implemented here on base or with our families or even Air Force Y. And I'll show you a little bit later down the road what, what is something that could happen like that. Um, again, real time information. Um, active duty service members, did you know that there's a compact to support your military student transition? State to state, ensuring that they, let's say, Let's say you had a preschool, a preschooler, that they're three years old, and they attended preschool in a public school district at three years old in Maryland. And you come here to Texas, and our compensatory age for school is six. But you want your child to attend a preschool program, and they offer pre-K for four years and up. If you have the documented proof showing that your child was three and attended pre-K in Maryland, they will accept your child active duty service. That compact will help ensure that transition support for your student. Um, other things, special education, um, gifted and talented, STEM, we do operate a Starbase program, so if you don't know what a Starbase program is, five, or grade five, they come here on space, they serve as schools within region 15, which is Texas breaks up into regions. They do all day STEM program, five days a week. It is phenomenal. If you have a chance to volunteer or you want to know more about it, it's literally right next to the CDC down the same road. Phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. And it was life changing for San Angelo when we imp implemented that program because it kind of pivoted STEM education within our entire community. Okay. Um, readiness and retention. How many of you have ever heard the, the slogan? Mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. If your families are not happy, if your students are not taken care of and they don't feel valued, that's a problem for you. That's a problem for the mission. That's a problem for your residents. We are here um, as a liaison to ensure that those students don't fall behind. They're going to have gaps right now in education. Of course they are. Every student across the world is experiencing it but we are here to be able to provide some of those unique supports like tutor.com. It's a free 24 seven, seven days a week, online tutoring service for families, military families, civilian families, anybody that's connected to an installation has access to this free site for online tutoring. Kindergarten all the way up through college. If you're taking college classes yourself, you can sign up for an account and you can take and have these tutors available to you as well. Awesome, awesome. Um, MFLAX, like I talked before about in the CDC. We have embedded MFLAX in two of our heaviest military impacted campuses within SAISD, San Angelo Independent School District, Glenmore and Bel Air. You'll see them a little bit later on this afternoon and I'll, I won't steal their thunder. But again, life-changing support, not only for your students, but for those educators that are educating your students. Because having that unique insight to maybe why all of a sudden a student's behavior has completely changed. They don't want to do work, they don't want to sit in their desk, they don't want to you know, communicate with the teacher and to find out that mom or dad has just deployed. Or mom and dad have been deployed for a month and a half and now the behaviors are starting to come out. The NFLAX have, the child NFLAX have certain credentials and criteria that they've done to be able to work solely with your children and work with those educators to be able to get everybody on the same page and, and help the success of the student. Okay. Um, again, 1.7 million in the total force for military connected students. That number goes up every day. <laughs> every day. Right now, Texas is number two. We kind of fall back and forth between Virginia for military connected students in our state. Um, and, and we do. In Texas, we work as Team Texas, have a total force. We meet monthly, we meet quarterly with our state education agency. We work with our Department of Defense state liaison for advocacy for things. Let's say we find that the military interstate compact really isn't being worked like it should. We advocate with our department of state liaison to be able to go to Texas state Congress and say, hey, look, 
this isn't working, we're, we're seeing this, this, and this, these are some trends that we're having across the state, how can we fix this for our military families? Um, let's see, again, for the program, a lot of us, um, you'll find across the Air Force, have either been military spouses ourselves, 20 year retired military spouse, my husband was a fire instructor, this is our third time here, so Angela was the choice for us to come back to. Um, this was the first place that our children ever called home. My husband joined the military at 18, we left home, but we grew up in all our lives, we knew each other since we were kids, and this was the first place they ever called home. So we always saw ourselves coming back here, we just weren't sure in what capacity, um, so being able to come back and, and really um, help grow and foster these best of partnerships within our base and community for the success of our families and our children, it is huge and, and it's very impactful. So this was one of the best practices I was talking about. Um, I worked with our public affairs on doing an infograph on how we can get out there, what it is that we truly do. Because a lot of people don't know what a school liaison is and what they do. They look at liaison and think, oh, education. It's my training. I can go and get, you know, find out when I had this cert done and um, oh, am I, am my CCA yet? Can I, can I continue or am I done with that? What do I do? Preschool through 12th grade education, um, and we just kind of put it in one format, and this was adopted as a best practice through the Department of Air Force. So, and now other branches are taking this on and, and making it their own too. Um, different things like that, being able to advocate and being able to provide that real time information to families. Again, education is constantly changing, and um, having that one person is that continuity to be able to go to and say, I remember that briefing I was at, and there was this lady that said something about preschool, and I, I don't know, and you have one of me at every Air Force base you go to. Sometimes two. <laughs> Again, this is my contact information, Teresa Goodwin. My main office is located down the street in the school aid building. Um, and I have virtual appointments, face-to-face -face appointments, you know, whatever fits your schedule or your needs. Maybe you have a spouse, um, or maybe you have a troop that's, that you're like, okay, you need to connect with this person. Uh, available all the time. <laughs> People find me on social media, uh, whatever. Um, and then I'm also on the Go Good Trello website as well. So anything that y'all need here to support and here to support your students in their education transition, making sure that they have the services, credits, everything you need. Right. Do you guys have any questions? Well, thank you all for your time. I appreciate you, and welcome to Good Fellow. So who's, uh, is this our first duty station? Anybody new? First duty station. Where do you guys work? Excuse me? Where do you work? Um, uh, the 17th contract this morning. Okay, what about you? Uh, the job office. Oh, that's good. Yeah, no, it's even more. Um, so my name is Kyra. I'm with the victim advocate, um, here at our soccer office. You see my picture up there. To the uh, left is Mr. Mark, who's our SARC. We also have a deputy SARC. Uh, Tech Sergeant Tresset, um, and we're about to get another victim advocate, which is great, so our, our office will be fully staffed up. Um, you guys are familiar with this program, right? You guys get all the what's a restricted, unrestricted report, and all that good stuff. All right, so the expectation is not that you know every detail, because that's our job, all right? We know all ins and outs, we know all the details. The big takeaway that I want you guys 
um, to remember is our office location, our office number, and then who in here is going to be supervising somebody else? Anybody? Instructors? So you're supervising all your students. You follow the chain of command. Okay, so that's an important piece. Are you guys firefighters, EMTs? Yes. Okay, so we'll be briefing you guys separately as well um, because EMTs are covered under the restricted reporting where a patient has an option not to report their sexual assault to law enforcement. So those of you that are coming in here to be instructors, obviously the biggest part of our population is students. Um, so usually MTLs, instructors, anytime anything happens, you guys are going to be one of the front line people where somebody will come up to you and disclose. So the important part of that is what do you do? So an instructor on your shoot, I can tell you, speaking of which, what's happening on sexually assault? First of all, yes, yes, I was like some keywords I was looking for. So your mandatory reporter to be supervised. Um, that's the first thing you tell the student or the person that your mandatory reporters, and then who would you tell? Uh, from there, I would either I would go straight to the victim advocate. Okay. Um, and be sure. Yes. So as a mandatory reporter, who are mandatory reporters? School of supervised instructors, MTLs, right? So as soon as discloses or uh, someone discloses, oh yeah, absolutely. You have to report at the chain of command. Um, yours is going to be a little bit kind of like double because you already need more law enforcement because you are. So you want to notify the shirt and the commander. They in turn will notify uh, OSI and whoever the investigating agency is. Uh, but the big piece that I have to do with is the victim, right? So make sure that you don't forget to call it. So a lot of times what happens is you go and tell the first sergeant, they do all the other stuff going on. Um, and they are trying to take care of their person, but they forget about us. We don't automatically find out about these things. So unless the victim or the supervisor comes to the victim and says, hey, I had this person who disclosed. Um, we've already told everybody else about it, but we want this person to get some help. So that's where we come in. Right? You can bring that person over, that person can come, talk to us on the phone. Oh, this is hard to talk to. Um, and then we'll take care of them. So our office provides um, different services. We provide access to mental health, the chaplain, um, and then we also advocate directly for our victim when it comes to concerns of like safety. Maybe the, the perpetrator or the offender and the, and the um, victim are in the same class. Maybe they live in the same dorm room or you know in the 200 dorms over here by the commissary and the VX. Those are like the, um, kind of the hotel style where they have the doors on the outside. And you can live, like male and females can live there. So we have one where um, a victim had the subject living two doors down. So we would advocate for the commander to help assist in making accommodations, okay? We want to make accommodations for things like PT, maybe they're on the same PT shift, or whatever the case may be. So just know that we're here to help. Also, if you just want to call and, and I've had this where instructors call and they say, hey, this person told me some stuff. I'm not sure if this is a disclosure. I'm not really sure what any of this means. Oops. Um, but hey, let me run it by you. That's perfectly fine. It turned out not to be um, sexual assault. It was a whole nother issue, but it, it did involve other things and other people. And that was more of a commander thing than it was a sapper thing. But I'd always rather you guys call so we can point you in the right direction. The most important piece is keeping that uh, victim's privacy and their options open. So now we're going to flip it. Let's say you are coworker to coworker. Okay, I'm going to have to take this. Um, we're coworker to coworker, and a fellow instructor and I come and disclose to you. At this point, as a coworker, he's not obligated, right? He's not in my chain of command, but he's not obligated to report but he can't offer advice. So hopefully in this case, what he would say is, hey, you know, sorry that happened to you. Okay, so one of these be understanding. Some people um, react better than others. Other people are like, oh my God, what were you doing there? Or what were you wearing? Or why were you wearing me? Uh, we don't want to make to blame. That's the most important thing, but we do want to help. So, hey, sorry that happened to you. You know, I just had my newcomer scrutiny and the sapper lady was there. I don't remember what her name is, but she said they're at this building at this number. Can I call for you? Can we go together and then bring them over? Again, you don't have to know all the questions. But that's like, hey, what is that restricted reporting? What is the restricted reporting? 
What is this? What is that? You don't have to know all the answers. All you have to do is pick up the phone and give us a call. Okay, so uh, one of the big things that a lot of our students, um, what do you call it, they, are, they believe, but it's not true, is that if you come to our office or if you call me, that you have to make a report, and that is not the case. So in this case, we're friends. Uh, he says, hey, let's go to the staff office. I'm like, nope, we want to go there because they're going to make me uh, file a report. He's going to be so super smart. He's going to say, no, they're not. If you go there, you can speak to somebody, tell the whole story, and decide, you know what, this is not for me. I'm not ready to deal with this right now. I'm not doing this. And get up and walk out. I'm not going to chase you. I'm not going to call your commander and be like, hey, airman or sergeant so-and-so came into my office, and I really think they need to file a report. That would take the whole privacy thing out of it, right? So whenever you're ready to come back, if you'd like to come back, then come back and file that report. So the misconception that you have to file something or that I'm going to tell someone is completely false. Okay, you can also call us up with a hypothetical. Call up and be like, hey, hypothetically, if I knew somebody was sexually assaulted, what can I do? We'll have that conversation. Um, none of us can make somebody report. I know that's a strong feeling that you might have if a friend came up to you and said, hey, I was sexually assaulted. Of course, being the friend, being supportive, you're thinking, let's go get that person. We need to bring justice, we need a, an investigation. Um, but those are our feelings. Those are the way we would feel in that moment, right? But we're not the victim. So all we can do as bystanders is um, support and then offer those options. Initially, they may not want that help. You know, no, I don't want to go to the staff office. I don't want anything to do with that. And maybe later they might. So maybe later, again, offer that, thing, offer that service. Hey, you know, have you given any more thought to talking to somebody at the staff office? Confidential, you don't have to file a report if you don't want to. And you can still get help. Okay, so kind of keep that at the back of your mind. That applies to everybody across the board. Our services apply to adults. So um, even if you're not more like sure what how that's gonna fall again, you can always call us and we'll refer you to the right service. So that would be family advocacy if it's anybody underage, um, or some type of domestic violence situation. But again, you don't have to figure it all out. If you give us a call. We can tell you where to go, if it's us, if it's somebody else. Um, the biggest takeaway, please, is that we are a helping agency. And regardless of whether it is us or not, we're going to get you help or the person that you call in on our behalf. So, uh, instructor, do you have today? Okay. Uh, 315? 312? 312? Okay, excellent. So, we have um, what we call the SASH program. So it's, uh, Students Against Sexual Assault and Harassment. So you'll see those guys walking around with that teal rope, teal and black rope. Big thing we have is we don't have too many from the fire department. A lot of times, and I, I work maintenance, so a lot of times we don't necessarily think all this helpful stuff and all of these like touchy feely type things are cool. Um, and I get that. But what we need is that support. We need that support to say, you know, we're not, a lot of the students um, get given a hard time, they joke about, them being the sex police and kind of, you know, joking about it. Um, but as an instructor, um, you can kind of back that up and no, they're not the sex police, but it's just somebody that they, um, in the unit, that if you see somebody wearing that teal rope, teal and black rope, you know, at the very minimum, they're gonna have my phone number. At a minimum, I know that that person knows more than the next guy about sexual assault, harassment, or where I can go to get help. So just kind of encourage that if you, um, if you're interested in participating, always come down. We're always looking for um, facilitators and mentors for our students. You will see them doing events. Um, our president, who is a firefighter actually, um, he's arranging a uh, dodgeball tournament and just kind of support. So these are the kinds of things that they do within our base community. Um, so again, please come out and support us if you see us out there. We do like pet therapy. Um, they give away like, t-shirts and different things at different events. Um, just to bring awareness. Uh, so if you are interested, please give us a call. So let me get to our phone number area. So instructors, MTLs, it's very important. You're probably going to want to take this down. We Our information should be everywhere. But I would just advise putting it in your cell phone. Because my cell phone has so many contacts, you think I was super popular, but it's all contacts from security forces, OSI, everybody you can imagine, um, just in case. So the cell phone is my duty cell. 
Mr. Barton and I have them all the time. We answer them all the time, 24-7. Um, we also have the on-call number at the bottom, 1570. One of us, the staff, or one of our volunteer victim advocates will have that phone. And another number you can reach, 24-7. Email's another good way, and then of course, the office phone. So, yes sir? You got that too, right? Or is there like an overall Air Force separate? So you can do the DOD Safe Helpline. That's also another great app for instructors and MTLs. I have that one on my phone too, because sometimes people don't necessarily fall into like sexual assault for me, so they don't necessarily fall into my realm. And maybe they're hesitant to go talk to a chaplain or talk to a behavioral health. Sometimes they can use that app. There's different things on that app that they can use um, that I guess can help them in the meantime until they're ready to actually somebody, see somebody in person. Or even civilians. Um, sometimes I recommend the, the DOD safe helpline for them um, because they don't qualify for us or it doesn't fall under our role. I'm not really good at following this slides. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I do like to read our mission, establish a national benchmark for recovery and eliminate sexual assault through empowering and engaged airmen. So that kind of is something, again, like I say, it takes everybody. These new airmen are kind of very into um, the culture change, a lot of the hashtag, you know, I'm at Venezuela, me too. All of these movements have kind of come up in their young lifetime. Okay, these things weren't around until we were around when I was younger. Um, some of you may be able to relate. Um, but, they're already kind of bought into that program. They're already bought into those ideas. And so for the rest of us, it's really just supporting those ideas and supporting kind of what the Air Force core values are, right? The whole idea of family and taking care of each other. So I think it's a pretty easy ask, right? Just to kind of take care of the person next to you. At a minimum, know, hey, I don't have all the answers, but I know someone who does, okay? We don't cover sexual harassment. But we do get calls all the time. They kind of explain what happened. And we can you know, draw that line of yes or no, it wasn't. And then we'll make the referral over to EO. Um, instructors, well, everybody overall, but I see this a lot with our students. So we talk a lot about the continuum of harm, um, allowing things to go by, not saying anything, not speaking up when things are happening that you know are not appropriate or not going down the right path. If we stand by and do nothing, obviously we're going to end up in that red, red section. So as NCOs, and those of you who are in charge of others, and as senior NCOs, et cetera, it's up to you guys to make sure that you're putting your foot down and drawing a line when it comes to things that you know are inappropriate, and they're going to foster a um, toxic environment that may lead to these other things that are going to create more headaches for you. So if we just nip that in the bud, it's going to be better for everybody. So again, you don't have to go all these definitions of what each thing is. You don't have to label it. If someone was touched inappropriately and it was unwanted contact, that's all you need to know when it comes to the sexual assault. Give us a call and we'll let OSI or one of us will break it down into one of these categories, okay? It's not necessarily something you guys have to memorize. We talk a lot about consent. So, Airmen may ask you what consent is or may explain a situation um, where you're like, ooh, let's talk about this, right? So consent, if someone is too drunk, they can't consent. If someone is under the influence of medication, maybe they just had surgery and they're taking pain meds that make them froggy, they're not able to consent. Um, and then the lack of no, that's a big one, the lack of somebody verbally saying no is not consent either. Because the act could be occurring under duress. Um, and of course they're not going to say anything if they're scared. Right. All right, so we talked about this. Um, so we do have confidentiality. Um, that confidentiality changes if someone comes in and says they are going to hurt themselves or hurt somebody else, or if we find out that there's some type of child abuse or neglect, we have to inform the authorities. So restricted, unrestricted, and independent. People get very confused with all of these, and that's okay. Restricted is when the individual has not told anybody else, has come to us and said, hey, something happened to me, we take care of it kind of in-house. So I know if the victim knows, and they can get services. I'm restricted, the victim comes to me, makes a report, we inform the chain of command, 
we inform OSI and an investigation starts. Now they are entitled to a few more things when they make an independent, or, sorry, an unrestricted report. One of those things being an expedited transfer. Has anybody heard of an expedited transfer? Okay, so our victims do have that option. And then an independent investigation would be the example that we had earlier, that I'm a student, come to my instructor and tell him something happened and he's obligated to report because he's a mandatory reporter. So think of it as an investigation starting outside of the staff office. It's independent from us. I have no idea, I'm in my office working, I have no idea that this is going on within his squadron until someone notifies me. And if the victim decides to come over, we can help them from there. Does that make sense? Okay, so mandatory reporters, that's kind of important. So mandatory reporters, law enforcement right here with my friends and my security forces guys. So um, no one in their chain of command um, or anybody random can come up there and tell them without the expectation of it being reported. Um, so if it is a friend or someone that you know within your unit, my advice to you guys would be maybe stopping them before they get to the whole story. Sometimes you get that vibe like, mm, that doesn't sound good, you can stop them and be like, hey, I want, to under I want you to understand that if you proceed, and I think this has to do with sexual assault, and if it does, I have to report it. That way that person telling their story has the option and understands that, hey, if I keep going, my mandatory reporter and security forces friends will have to report me or report the incident. Um, and it may not be anything with sexual assault. I can be like, oh, no, 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 it has nothing to do with that, it's something else. Keep going with your conversation. But that way you give that person the option to kind of shut it down and maybe call us at our office before they proceed. So of course, all the commanders, First sergeants, instructors, MTLs, anybody in your chain of command, your immediate supervisor is a mandatory report. Um, and if you disclose, so this is another one. If you're not sure whether it falls under sexual harassment or sexual assault, check with us first because we have that confidentiality. So if you disclose and it is sexual assault, it stays here. But if you go to EO first and you disclose what you think is sexual harassment and it turns out to be sexual assault, they are mandatory reporters. So your option of being restricted kind of goes out the window. It's going to start an independent investigation. So I always say it's uh, better to be safe than sorry. So please give us a call. I'm always happy to answer the phone, talk to you about it. Again, you don't have to file the report. So some of the, the top two up there, chaplain and mental health, are one of the ones that I really advocate for when our students come in. And you see in the red, it's non-confidential. So when we talked about going to EO and disclosing. And then the MFLEX, um, some of them are embedded in our training squadrons. Um, if you disclose to them, they report to us. Although there was a call to say, hey, this person disclosed a sexual assault in a session, and I am sending them over to you. So they won't call the police or anybody else, but they do have to tell me. And then, of course, the DOD self safe helpline is there as well. Does anybody have any questions? Do you guys have any of our cards? Yes. Perfect. So these are mandatory items for our students, um, but they're not mandatory, mandatory items for anybody else. But it's good to have. Put in your wallet, put in your car, maybe at your desk, just in case. Um, hopefully, nobody ever talks to you about sexual assault because it doesn't happen. But in case it does, you're going to be fine. All right. We'll get those passed out. Y'all have a good day. Yeah, with that patch program, I kind of caught on to that when I did the South Trinity when I went all over the last month. Oh, man, boy. So what do you know? She's going to be talking about it. And then you should have a lot of people who are going to be talking about it. And once you said that, the person gets notified and says, hey, this is being made from your name, and this is being made from another name. 
to uh, Victims Council, so I'm a victims paralegal. I work with Captain Mitchell. He is the Victims Council attorney, and we represent victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. Caveat to the domestic violence, uh, currently we're taking on cases that are egregious, such as if there was a knife involved, or the subject communicated a threat on the victim's life, um, or there's strangulation involved. So things like that, those are getting accepted pretty quickly. However, there is what is called an extraordinary circumstance request that we can send up, and it's just based off of the circumstances of that case, and then it, it takes a higher approval authority to get those approved. Sometimes they get approved, sometimes they don't, but we can at least try, okay? All right, so overview of what I'll be going over today. Purpose, SBC program and services. Overview of the legal process, expedited transfers, myths and trends, potpourri, and then I'll go over our pilot program. All right, so uh, our, the, the Victims Council is pretty new. Started in 2013, so new laws are coming out all the time. Um, so our, even though we are geographically located, our office, uh, our command is actually located in Washington, D.C. Uh, so we fall under AFLOA, and our primary responsibility is for our client. So whatever our client is wanting to do, that's what we're going to push for. The Victims Council will advise the client, but, you know, whatever they, they're wanting to do, that's what we're going to do. All right, so our purpose is to empower, advise, and advocate. So essentially, we are the mouthpiece for the victims. Once they obtain an, a VC, anyone that wants to talk with the victim, they would have to come through us. Also, uh, we develop the victim's understanding of the military justice process and help them through that process. And then we advocate for their rights and make sure that their rights are afforded to them. All right, so some ways that we can help. So under Article 6B is where the victim's rights are. And like I said, we make sure that their rights are afforded to them, such as the right to be heard. The govern or the, um, the command is gonna wanna know what the victim wants out of this, whether it be Article 15, a discharge, uh, go to a court martial, or maybe they don't want anything to happen at all. Sometimes, you know, a friend might report it, and they didn't really want it to get reported, they just wanted somebody to talk to. Okay. Assert privileges, so just like the SART, we have an attorney-client privilege, and I fall under that privilege as well. So anything that the victims or the clients say to us will uh, remain with us. Case disposition advocacy, so we will keep the victim updated uh, through the whole process. Every month we meet with the command and uh, get updates and we'll be in contact with OSI and the legal office pretty much through the whole process. And enhance access to care, so anything that the victim needs as far as care, medical, mental, uh, we can make sure that they have that. And then correct any disconnect, sometimes uh, there might be miscommunication with the command, legal office, OSI, what have you, and we just make sure that everybody's on the same page. Legal assistance, so we can help with legal assistance. Um, however, with divorce, they would have to actually obtain a civilian attorney to represent them in court. The VC can advise them, but they, they can't be there in court to represent them. Uh, we can help with landlord and tenant stuff. Other issues, we do refer them to the legal office to help them out. Um, but if it's something like that, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. And then, Assisting with collateral misconduct, so 90% of our cases are alcohol related. Uh, that being said, sometimes we get clients that, are, that have been underage drinking. And if that's the case, if their report is still restricted, the VC can go to command and say, hey, I got a victim that wants to come forward. However, there's some collateral misconduct with underage drinking. Usually, if it's something like that, the commander is willing to say, hey, tell them to come forward. We won't do anything with that. However, if it's something more than that, we can always work with the Area Defense Council to get whatever it is mitigated. 
and then uh, bringing unknown safety issues to the commander. So say the subject lives in close proximity to the victim or maybe they, they're in the same class or they, uh, they go to the same, or they go to lunch at the same time, we can let the command know, put maybe get a military protective order or no contact order in place or you know, um, get them moved to another dorm and what have you. And then advocate for unrated periods. So during these times, it's pretty hard for victims. So their performance at work may decline. If that's the case, we can advocate to get them an unrated period for, for that time so that they're not deemed on their EPR or OPR. And then assist in access to information. So like I said, we'll, we will get the report of investigation from OSI. We'll be in contact with them at all times. Same thing with the legal office. So um, we'll have access to that information. And then attending interviews. So once a report has been made, uh, there's going to be a lot of people wanting to talk to the victim. And uh, if they're wanting to interview the victim, they, the victim doesn't have to go into the interview alone. The VC or myself can attend those interviews, and we will prep the client before they actually interview so they know what to expect going in. And then advocacy to military justice actors, including commanders and committing authorities. Um, same thing. So uh, like I said, every month we will meet with the commander and the parties involved to update them and get case updates. And then in court representation, the VC will be present in court. The only time the victim actually has to be present is to testify. Other than that, they don't have to stay if they don't want to. Uh, and then the VC will advocate on their behalf. And then uh, filing claims uh, for lost damage property, self-explanatory, uh, assist with victim impact statements, clemency, and parole. We do help the client draft all those documents. And then ID uh, retaliation and ostracism. If um, that is going on in their unit, we can advocate to make sure that, that it stops. And then assisting with IG, congressional, and EO complaints, uh, we do assist with that. And any congressional stuff, we will help them draft that up as well. All right, so this is kind of a breakdown of how the legal process works. It can be kind of lengthy depending on what the offense is. If it's uh, a sexual contact, it can be anywhere from six to 12 months. If it's a sexual assault, it can go all the way up to two years. Uh, so it usually starts out off uh, a report is made. Uh, once the report is made, an investigation will kick off. Uh, once the investigation is done, a report of investigation will um, be distributed. The commander will look at it, and then he'll make a decision on what he wants to do, whether it be an Article 15, uh, discharge, court martial, what have you. And then um, if it goes to a court martial, then it, it, gets, it gets a little lengthier. All right, so expedited transfers. So uh, this is an option for victims of sexual assault. So uh, if they make an unrestricted report and it's a credible report, then they can actually choose to go to another base. Um, we usually advise them to pick a place where they'll have to, some type of support, whether it be family, friends, um, something like that. And another option would be to try and get the accused All right, so some myths. All victims want to go to a court martial. So going to a court martial can be pretty nerve wracking, especially, you know, they have to testify and the accused is gonna be in the room. So a lot of times they, they may not want to go through that. And like I said, it is a lengthy process. So they might just want to see an Article 15 and discharge, something like that. And then victims get to dictate what happens. So they'll get a say or they'll, they'll be heard of what they want. But at the end of the day, it is up to the commander to make the final decision on this disposition. And then trend, like I said, 90% of our, our, our cases are alcohol related. All right, so some potpourri. I, I believe the 
went over restricted and unrestricted, of course, with you guys. Right. Um, so mandatory reporters, um, law enforcement, uh, supervisors, uh, anybody in the chain of command. For tier ropes, uh, those are the ropes that work with the FAT and the SART. A lot of times clients or victims think that they have the same privilege as the SART or the FAT, but they don't. So anything that they tell the teal ropes, if OSI were to ask them the questions, then they would have to disclose that information that the client told them. And then, question for you guys. How many drinks can a person have before they're unable to consent? One? Anybody else? You can take a guess. No? No takers? Okay. So it depends. Okay? We're all different sizes, we all have different tolerances. But if it goes to a court martial, then it'll be up to the jury to decide whether that person was able to consent or not. A lot of times they'll take into consideration what witnesses have to say. You know, the witnesses are saying, no, they were walking and talking like normal, or no, they needed help to the room, or they were passed out, things like that. And then I talked about collateral misconduct, and then cross complaints. Essentially, that's where um, you get two people making a report about each other, so that you know, essentially, two subjects, and OSI has to figure out who's the actual victim in the case. All right. So I'm going to go over our pilot program. Um, they're allowing one-time consultations for essentially if you're just a victim of some sort and there's, the subject is subject to the UCMJ. Uh, so it could be harassment, like EO type stuff. Uh, you'll get the one-time consultation and then we can help the client get the resources they need. And then, but in the process when we're talking, if we feel like you, you could be able to get the SPC services, then we'll go ahead and route up an ECR, which is the extraordinary circumstance request. All right. all right, that's all that I got. Do you guys have any questions for me? We are located in the wing building. That's, uh, the front of the building has all the flags and the coffee shop finance is there too as well. The legal office is there too, but we're on the first floor. The legal office is on the second floor, so. If you're looking for us, we are by the coffee shop on the first floor. No questions? All right, you guys have a good one. All right, guys. Um, if you want to take a break, come back at 10.40, um, and then we'll resume at that point.
All right, good morning, everybody. I'm going to pull my mask down, but kind of far away, six feet from here. Uh, I am Nick Navarro. I am the Chief Complaints Resolutions Office. Um, kind of going to tell you what our office does for you. Most of the people who have been in here know what about the Inspector General. We have them on every base. You can go to them if you have issues. So we all do have a complaint system on, uh, in, in the Air Force. So if you need to have something that's not going right or you don't know where to go or who to bring your issue to, a lot of times you can bring your issue to us and we'll kind of tell you where you, need, you can go or what other agency out there can help you. And that's what I'm going to talk to you and go through here on how we how we handle that stuff and what kind of gives us the authority to do that stuff. Our authority to do some of this stuff is, is governed by 90-301, which is the uh, Inspector General Complaint Resolution uh, Instruction. That tells us exactly what we can do when we get a complaint. Uh, that gives us the authority to pull records. We can pull any record that we need with the exception of those records that may be legal, uh, that have confidentiality that we can't pull, or some of your medical records. Can we go get medical records? We have to go through the, through, the, through the legal side, but we can still pull a lot of those records. And most of the time when I say pull records, we can pull records from anywhere. Uh, we can pull your piss, we can pull stuff from mail PDS, we can pull anything that we need to be able to do a complaint analysis on the issue you bring forward to us. Uh, we are the eyes and ears for the commander, but I like to say we are the eyes and ears for the base. We, you will see us walking around this base. Uh, myself and Matt started the before she retires on me. Uh, but uh, whoever comes in after her, we will, you will see us on base. We go to troop walk, we talk to a lot of the students, we go to different uh, units. And what we're trying to do, we're trying to get a pulse. We're trying to see what's going on on the base. And then we talk to people to see what's going on and see if there's any issues lingering or is there any stuff that's being done that maybe Somebody doesn't feel that it's being treated or being done correctly. Uh, so at that point, we look at it, we make an assessment of it, we do an inquiry on it, and then we think that there's something there that the commanders need to address, and then we'll provide it to the commander with what we found, and we'll let the commander handle the issues. Because again, these are commander issues, they're not my issues, but we're looking for stuff because if it affects people, and then the commanders need to address it. So uh, that's what we do. We handle more than just complaints. This is our what I call the IGQ donut. We do we do our briefings like just like here. We do the education piece. We do the hotlines, whatever the hotline. Uh, if you don't feel that you can come to Good Fellow Air Force Base to file a complaint to our office, you know, saying you know what I'm going to take it to the DOD channels or I'm going to take it to the Air Force channels and higher up through the websites or whatever. You can do that. Just be cognizant that if you send a complaint to the DOD or you send a complaint to uh, the Air Force level, they're going to look at that issue. If that issue is a base issue here, they're going to send it right back to us. And we're going to handle it. The issue has to be handled where it's at, um, depending on what it is. So please, please, please remember that it is coming back to us. So come see us. Give me a phone call. Call me. Whatever you need to do, we can discuss it and we can see it. And then we can address it the way we need to address it. We do brief all the senior officials. What does that mean, senior officials? We brief, we brief most of the people coming in that are the commanders. Uh, we do brief some uh, first sergeants that on a one-on-one -on -one basis they do with some of the chiefs to let them know what your rights are as a blue suitor, as a civilian. What are your rights? Because everybody has rights. And according to 901, one of your rights is that you can file a complaint if you, there's, if you deem that there's something wrong going on. So that is your right. And they can't tell you that you can't file a complaint. Uh, and nobody should be able to tell you that. Uh, we do sit at a lot of meetings, or a lot of things that are going to be done through if they're going to implement new programs, new policies, new stuff in place like that. We sit in those meetings to make sure that the implementation of, or the program or the policy that they're going to implement are fair, fair and equitable to everybody across the board. Because that is what we are about. We make sure that we're fair and equitable and we're treating everybody with dignity and respect. That is the biggest thing and that is something coming directly from the Wing Commander. The biggest things that we do or the Inspector General complaints does is a reprisal and restriction. I'm going to go over what reprisal and restriction is. But that is our bread and butter, that is what we, what we do. We don't get a lot of that, but it does happen. And it does happen on this base, so I have to do an investigation on that. Um, we are an investigative agency, what does that mean? It means that you bring an issue to us, and after I've done my inquiry, I've done my complaint analysis, I can't truthfully answer it, or I cannot get enough information to make a good determination based on the facts and based on what the AFI is saying. At that point, I do a memo, I send it up to the wing commander and say, hey, sir, ma'am, we need to go to investigation. Most of the time, they're going to tell us yes. Most of the stuff that we investigate, again, reprisal and restrictions. Anytime that I get a reprisal and restriction for a military member, for a military member, not civilian, and I'll go over a little bit of what civilians do, what civilians do, but for military members, 
If you bring to me a reprisal or restriction case and you tell me that it's a reprisal or restriction, I have 10 days to get to the DOD. What it does, I get it, I look at it, do my quick pen analysis on it, I gather all as much information as I can, I package it up, I send it to ATC, ATC sends it to SAS, SAS is in the DOD with the reprisal and restrictions. DOD is aware that we possibly have something going on here. After those 10 days, we've got another 30 days to make a determination, is it reprisal and is it restriction? Or do we need to investigate it to determine? So that is the thing. Sometimes it comes out when we're doing our complaint analysis and we get all the data, we, we look at it, what you might have termed as reprisal is not reprisal because this didn't happen. Reprisal has a couple of pieces that we have to follow because it's according to the law. And if it doesn't follow those pieces, then it's not reprisal. But that's what we're here and that's what we're trained on. So we make sure that happens. If we ever go to an investigation, and we have to do an investigation and we come out and we start doing interviews. You're gonna know, if you're the complainant, you're gonna know that we're going to do it. Because one, we're gonna tell you. We're gonna send you a memo, we're gonna keep you aware of what's going on with your issue or your complaint or your allegation or whatever you bring to us. We're gonna let you know. Hey, look, we're gonna have to investigate this. Or hey, look, we need more information. Or you need to go here, this is where you need to go. Or we're gonna dismiss it because there's nothing there. We're gonna do those things and we're gonna let you know. So you, it's not a guessing game by you. And we're not going to keep you guessing. We're going to tell you what you're going to do with your complaint. If we got to investigate, we're going to tell you we're going to investigate it. And you're going to know the investigation starts. But guess what? The first person that gets the best uh, interview is going to be you. We're going to go directly to the complaint. Because we want to make sure that we got all the stuff that we need from you, that your issues, you might have only brought one or two issues, but now there's a couple more issues. We want to make sure that all of that stuff is encompassed into that one investigation. We don't want to do an investigation on two or three issues, and then there's we find out later that there's probably six issues. We want to do it all together so that we can investigate it one time. We start interviewing the, the, the complainant, then we go to subject, and then we go to the subject. Uh, when we're there, we're not there to be your friends, but we're not there against you either. We're there to gather facts. That's all we're there. We're going to interview you, we're going to gather facts so that we can make it a good determination when we're doing a complaint analysis. Is it reprisal? Or if it is reprisal, will it substantiate it or not substantiate it? It is not a court proceeding, so you're not guilty, you're not innocent. If somebody violated the law or with a wrongdoing of the AFI policy or whatever it may be, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, determine that during that uh, investigation. Uh, and uh, let me go back. That investigation, it's gonna get closed out here, but it is not done until it's adjudicated by the DOD uh, WRI IG staff. They look at all our complaints when it comes to reprisal restrictions. So it goes all the way up, and then they look at it, and there's a bunch of lawyers, there's a bunch of other folks up there, investigators, they've been doing it a lot longer than I have, and they look at it, and they make sure that we got it authorized, across all our teeth, that we follow the law to the T. Something's not done right, and then they come right back to us and say, hey, you know, you did these, but you need to reinvestigate this because you didn't answer them. You didn't answer it by the law. So uh, there is somebody overlooking all our stuff. Follow that complaint. If you have any of these issues, you should follow a complaint, no matter what. If you're in uniform or in clothes, you should follow a complaint. If you see any of these uh, six issues. Please, please, do not wait until you need good fellow Air Force Base to follow a complaint. A lot of people will say, you know what, or I'm going to wait until that individual leaves and then I'm going to follow a complaint. Individual leaves a year later after the incident happened. Please don't do that. What we call that, we call that a cold facts case. It's hard to determine what's going, going to go on because people PCS, people separate, people retire. When people separate, retire, we can call them if they're part of, uh, of the witnesses, but they don't have to participate. They can tell us, mm, no, I'm not in the airport, I don't want to get involved. So it makes it really, really hard for the investigator to come up with a good gathering of evidence because we don't have the people that we need to. And also please remember, use your chain of commands. That's what they're there for. Use your chain of commands. Now, of course you're not gonna go to your chain of command if your chain of command is the issue. But you can always go to, if you're having an issue with your squadron, you can go to the group. If you're having it with a group, you can go to the wing. If you don't feel comfortable going to the group or to the wing, come see us, we will come. Again, we will tell you where to go. Um, if you have a IG investigatable item or if you have an IG issue, but it's not an IG investigatable item. And we will tell you, we will tell you exactly what we need to do and how we need to do it, or how we're gonna proceed with your, with your, because uh, you're gonna get notified of that. We will let you know. Follow my plan again, don't wait. Just because we get a lot of cold cases, 
When some of these things come out and they're a year, two years old, it makes it really hard for the investigator. If we come in and we can't do a good claim analysis, guess that your case is probably going to get dismissed because it's going to be beyond facts, undue facts. It's it's too old. Now for reprisals, I mean for restrictions, they have no time limit, so you can file one anytime. But it does again. It makes it really really hard to uh, to do this kind of uh, investigation on that. You can file a complaint for yourself. And there's different ways you can file a complaint for yourself. You can come into my office and file a complaint. I know who you are. I put my eyes on you, you put your eyes on me. File a complaint. And then on block eight of our 102, our Air Force form complaint form, you put, I do consent to release my information outside the ID channels. If you mark that box, again, that is your decision. Nobody else's, that is your decision. And we will not press you one way or the other, but we will explain to you what the ramifications are if you do, do or do not. If you put do, anything that you give us, you bring us EPR, you bring us whatever you bring us, and we see the complaint is not an ID investigatable item, but it is going to the command. 95% of our issues go back to the command, but that's their command issue. If you mark I do, we're going to take all the information you gave us and we're going to send that back to the appropriate agency or the appropriate command without redacting your information. If you mark, I do not want my name to be released outside the ID channels, at that point, anything that you give us to include that 102 that has all your personal information will be redacted. We're going to send that information, that stuff to the commander or uh, the agency chief, but they're not, going to, they're not going to know who you are. The only people that know who you are is myself and you, and my, my boss, the inspector general, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rieger. Other than that, nobody knows. The only thing that happens that sometimes if the issue is solely on yourself makes it really, really hard for the commander or the staff agency to assist you because they don't know who they're assisting. If the individual issue allegation belongs to yourself. Now, if, the, if you have an issue and there's an issue maybe with a section with part of a flight or whatever it may be, and then the commander can focus on the issue within the flight. Because it's not, the issue is not solely pertaining to you. It pertains to maybe 10, 11, 12, 20 people, depending on what, what size of the issue it is or the section. So they can address the issue because they're addressing the section. They're trying to find out what's going on there. Or you can file a complaint anonymously. Complaint anonymously, they do it many, many ways. But the most, place, the most preferred way is they call me and they say, I want to file a complaint, but I, do, I want to be anonymous. So you give me your complaint, I will not ask you for your name. The only thing about it, remember I said that you will always be notified? With an anonymous complaint, you're not going to get notified. Because we don't know who you are. I don't know who you are, so I can't, I can't tell you what's going on with your complaint, and I can't even acknowledge that we received your complaint, other than when I get the phone call. That's it. Now what a lot of people, other people do is that they create an email address, and they send me a complaint via email, if I get that, I'm going to try to respond back to that email and let you know that I received your complaint. But that's all you're going to get. That is all you're going to get. That I received your complaint. I acknowledge. You're not going to get anything that happened with your complaint. You can come into my office a week, a month, two months later, say, hey, Mr. Morrow, I submitted a complaint on this day, and it was in reference to that. I said, great. But if it was anonymous, you're not going to get nothing. And you said, well, it was me to submit a complaint. I cannot verify or validate that, so you're not going to get nothing. That's just the way it works. And that is what's it's in the system. And that's the way the, not only does it work for the Air Force, it works for all DOD. That's the way it works. Uh, now, you can file a complaint for your wingman. You're going to get an acknowledgement saying, hey, we received the complaint, we're looking at it. The only thing about it, the stuff that you're going to get back of what happened, it's going to be very limited what you're going to get back. Unless that individual that you filed a complaint for comes into our office, and those what we call a pass, a privacy act release statement, you're not going to get much. Because you file a complaint for somebody else, we still got to protect that individual's identity uh, and all his personal information. So you might not get much back. So uh, a lot of people come into our office, not from y'all, a lot of the students would come into our office. When they get notified by their commander that they're getting administrative discharge, and they say, hey, can you stop it? The answer is no. Again, I am not a commander. We are not commanders as inspector generals. We're given the authority to review issues, but we don't have no commanding rules. 
So I can't say, you know, we're gonna put you on there and hold. That's not gonna be a no, we can't do that. That is in the AFI. And I can't stop anything if the matter starts. The only thing we can do if somebody comes to us and say, hey, I am being gonna be discharged, because my commander already gave me the notice, because most of the time when you're gonna get discharged, you're gonna get notified by your commander. They're gonna bring you in, they're gonna read you what they're gonna do, what they're gonna do. The only thing that I can do is make sure that that issue is being done correctly and you're being treated fairly. Pick up the phone and I make sure that all the process is being done correctly. Other than that, that is the only thing as the Inspector General that we can do to make sure that you're not being treated unfairly. How are complaints handled? These are the ways that complaint handled. You come to me with an issue and you're coming from here from Hickam and the issue happened at Hickam, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to send it right back to Hickam. I'm going to take it then I'm going to transfer it back. Because the issue happened at Hickam, it needs to be handled at Hickam, not here. All the witnesses, all the, all the stuff happened at Hickam, they know all about it, so, and we're not going to do it across the pond. We're going to send it directly where it goes. That's a transfer. Or you have an issue with AAPC, and AAPC is the, is, the only, is the only part of that. At that point, we're going to take it, we're going to look at it, if the issue belongs to AAPC, uh, we're going to send it there to the representative at AAPC and say, hey, AAPC, you got an issue. This is our complaint, and they're having an issue with that. So that's some of the stuff that we transfer. Uh, assist, you come into my office. You have a pay issue. Make an appointment, you go to finance. That's an assist. We're telling you where to go. Or you come into my office, and you're sitting down, and I'm listening to your intake, and I'm hearing discrimination, discrimination. I'm going to let you finish, and then I'm going to make my assessment, and I'm going to tell you probably if you're talking discrimination, whatever it may be, probably need to go talk to EO. They handle discrimination, I don't, or our office doesn't. Now, in your discussion, there's not only EO stuff, there's unprofessional and other stuff like that that is maybe not an IG directly related issue. We will take those issues, and their command issue, we'll send those back to the command. We will take the discrimination part of it. We'll separate your, we will separate your, um, your issues, and we will separate the issue that goes to EO to EO. Let the professionals handle it, that know what they're doing with it. Uh, that's an assist. Now, with the referral, again, like I said, 95% of the stuff that we get are referrals. They come to us, and it's a command issue. So we send it back to the command. Now, if you have an issue with your squadron commander, are we going to send it back to your squadron commander? Of course not. We're going to send it up to the group commander so they can review it and address it. If you have an issue with the group commander, policy or whatever it may be, send it to the wing commander. Let them look, let him look at it. If we have an issue, you have an issue with the wing commander's policy or whatever it may be, and then we're going to send it off base with ATC. I'm going to do your intake, and then I'm going to notify you that your issue has been sent over to ATC, and those are people that are going to handle your complaint. Because indirectly, the wing commander is my boss. We cannot do this, right? We cannot do investigations on our boss or review stuff with our boss. So what we end up doing, we're going to send it off, send it off base. We'll send it to ATC. ATC will run it and they'll do what they need to do with it. And then they'll notify you. They'll notify you once that they got it, just like I the announcement, and then they're going to notify you what they're going to do with your issue. So uh, you're always going to be a game. Be told what's going on. Dismiss. I don't dismiss much, dismiss much, but the only ones that I dismiss are two places since I've been here. When you submit a complaint, whether it be an email or you give it to me on a 102, you always ask for it, ask for an email and ask me for a, a phone where I can contact you. Again, you bring an issue to me, you know the issue like a back of your hand that it happens to you. I don't know the issue. The only thing I know from the issue is the stuff that you give with me that I read and the records that I pulled and the information that you gave me verbally. Other than that, that's all I know. So there might be stuff, stuff in there that we might need to clarify. What happened here? Why did that happen here? So we will need to clarify that. So, and then if, well, we're gonna go back to that form and we're gonna see where your email address is or your phone number, and I'm, and I'm gonna use both. I'm gonna call you and I'm gonna email you, hey, you need to contact our office because I need, I need to gather more information. I will do that three times in a 10 day period. You don't respond, I'm gonna dismiss your case. I don't have enough information to do complaint analysis or we'll dismiss the case. Simple as that. Now, you were TDY, you emergency leave, whatever, and you said, Mr. Rock, couldn't get it because I was doing away. You can always come back, refile your complaint, and we'll open up with another case number and we'll proceed. So 
So just because we dismiss it once doesn't mean that we dismiss it forever. You bring it back to us, and we haven't investigated it yet, and then we'll pursue it. And then investigate. We investigate in accordance with Title 10 U.S. Code 1034. That is the Whistleblower Act. The Whistleblower Act states that if you perceive a wrongdoing has been committed, you have the right to file a complaint without the fear of reprisal or being restricted. Does anybody here know what reprisal is? I hope you do, but you should. Reprisal. You come to see me on a Monday. On a Wednesday, they call you in and they give you paperwork because you come to see me. No, no, they can't do that. That's reprisal. Now, you come to see me on a Monday. They call you on a Wednesday and they give you paperwork because you were late or you didn't do something that you were supposed to do and they give you paperwork for that issue. Is that reprisal? No. They're holding you accountable. That's discipline. You're not 100% sure of what it is? Come see me and we'll talk to you. We'll go through the timeline. We'll establish the timeline and we'll tell you if it's reprisal or not. And that's what we look for. Restriction. What is restriction? Your supervisor. Your first sergeant, the chief, squad chief, squad commander, or anybody in that chain, up the chain of command, tell you that you cannot file a complaint when they say you will not go to the IG or you will not go to your congressional member to file a complaint. That's restriction. They can't do that. You have every right to file a complaint if a wrongdoing has been perceived. That is your right, and they can't tell you not to. Now, what some commanders from first sergeants and supervisors might say is, you can't go right now. But, as soon as we're done with this class, before we're done with this training session, before we're done with the mission, after that you can go. That's not restriction. So they're telling you, can't go right now because we're busy. But as soon as we're done here, you can go. Or, what some commanders will do with commander call is, before you go to the IG, come to me, maybe I can fix your issue so you don't have to go to the IG. So that's what they're saying is, give me the opportunity to fix your issue before going to the Inspector General, or before going to your congressional room. He says, you know what, I don't want to go to them, I'm going to go directly to the IG, or I'm going to go directly to the congressional room. That's your right, you can do that. So please, 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 and like I said, this is the law, so we follow it and fine tooth comb. That's why it's looked at it in so many places. We got four echelons that it goes up to, and they're making sure that we are following the law to the T when it comes to whistleblower act. Confidentiality, we don't offer confidentiality in our office. But we do work on a need to know basis. You come into my office, your supervisor, your commander sees you, your first sergeant sees you, and then they come after you leave, they come and say, hey, what did it so and so on. Sir, my answer then is going to serve, you don't have a need to know at this time. That's as simple as that. I'm not going to tell them. Now, if you decide to file a complaint and it is a referral and it goes back to the commander, at that point I will address it to the commander. I will send all the documentation to the commander, that's the only person I talk to in that command. Or in that squadron. If I send it to the staff agency chief, I'll send it to the staff agency chief. And then we also let them know it says this is privileged information. Please protect it according with uh, because it is uh, privileged information. So um, if you want to talk to somebody in confidentiality, the good chaplains are back there, you can talk to them, or you can talk to ADC. Now, I did say civilians earlier, we don't do your reprisal. Because you do not follow under 10 uh, 1034. They follow in a completely different realm. So if you come to us and you're claiming reprisal, we're probably going to send you to the CPO, or we're going to give you a website where you can go to. Uh, it website will go directly to DOD, because the laws and the, and the provisions are different. Uh, so we don't do civilian reprisals. We'll send you, we'll send you, and we'll give, we'll give you the, the address of where you need to call, who you need to contact, but we ourselves, our office cannot do that for you because we we're not allowed to do that because we're not trained on, on the statute. Contact information. You can take a picture of it if you want. Hopefully not, I don't have to see you for any crazy reasons. But if you do need to see us for something, we're right across the street from this building. Building 300. You don't need an appointment to come see us, you can come on and in. A lot of times people come to our office, they don't follow a complaint when they leave. They just wanted to know, hey, can I get some clarification about how this works or what I need to be doing or who can I go see? 
That's fine, you can do that. And we'll tell you where you need to go. I won't hide anything from you, but the only thing that I ask is when you come to see me, I'm gonna ask a lot, a lot of questions. Be 100% truthful with me when you, when you give me that information. Because guess what, folks? We will dig. It takes, uh, 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 it's a long process. It's a slow process, I should say. Um, the Inspector General side of it, it's a slow process. Commander side is a lot bit quicker because they have the authority of command. But we are going to dig and we're going to be very, very thorough. So please tell us everything that's going on because we're going to find out anyway. Any questions? I usually don't get any. Thanks. And we're going to get to All right, we're going to transition right into Chapel Services. Good morning. How are you all doing? Great. Good. Welcome to Goodfellow. Uh, it's my privilege to welcome you. My name is Chaplain Blackburn. I'm the lead chaplain here. This is Sergeant Peterson. He's one of my NCOICs. He's one of my religious affairs airmen. So, why do we have the chapel for? What do we do for you guys? Please talk. There's a Marine back there. Expert, well, he wants a Marine, always a Marine. So, there's a Marine back there who says that I'm standing between him and his briefing and him and his lunch then. So, please talk so he doesn't beat me up. <laughs> yes, sir. Counseling session. Counseling, what's special about our counseling? It's uh, restricted. Restricted. So, what do you mean by that? <laughs> uh, you, uh, you're not required to uh, bring it up to the chain of command. Not required? Yes. Is you that can't. it? You can't. I can't. Yes. I cannot bring it up to the chain of command. Any exceptions to that? Crimes have been committed. Crimes have been committed? No. You're shaking your head. No. Harm. So what's that? Like it's harm of self or others. Harm to self or harm to others. Okay. See, this is why I asked this question, because there's sometimes some confusion. We are 100% confidential. Anything that you share with us as chaplains are, it stays with us. So harm to self, harm to others, illegal activities. So if you go to MFLAC, which is also a great resource, if you go to a military one source, which is 12 free sessions per person per issue that you can call up and get uh, once a year, uh, they have a duty to report from self harm to others in the only by activities. You can tell me, Chaplain Blackburn, I love doing cocaine. I will tell you it's not good for your teeth, it's not good for your career. Please do not do it. But it will not go to a commander, it will not go to a judge, it will not go to a lawyer, it will not go to a supervisor, it will not go outside. The only time that I can share is if you give me written permission. I get Chaplain Blackburn permission to share with such and such for such and such purposes. And I, that doesn't even need to be the whole conversation. So that's good for you, that's good for your wingman. So, question. So, he, he's uh, one of my religious affairs airmen. Does he have 100 percent confidentiality? You say no. I'd say no. Only chaplains. Only chaplains? Ouch. How about you? Do you? Absolutely, 100 percent confidentiality. So why would I come see you versus me besides that I intimidate them with my muscles? Okay, so first chaplain Blackburn is buff, ripped, probably bleaches 300 in the gym. The second he strikes, talk to strikes. So if Sergeant in this bus, he's got, he may, I may be able to relate to him better when it comes to like on the ground, operational, kind of supervisory level than talking to Chaplain Blackburn, who's our wing chaplain here. Where wing, wing chaplain has the strategic kind of control over everybody else, and people like myself and my two airmen were working at the bottom. So Sergeant Blackburn was like, hey, that's another NCO. He's going to understand EPR, you know, having all these words expenses do, MIG-T and everything else, he's going to get it. So Sergeant Buzz would much rather probably come talk to me than the chaplain. I'm not saying that chaplain is not here for me, though. Yeah. So I will say that I'm one of the few chaplains on base that is prior to listed. So I understand the woes of the working man and woman. So uh, I've been there, done that. So are there any restrictions or uh, things that I can't talk to you about or things that I can't do with you? With so the, counseling? the only difference between myself and the chaplains is I cannot give you religious advice. So let's say you come to the office and you may want um, advice, let's say if you're a Christian, I can't sit here and be like in the book of, or in this place you may, I can't do that because I don't have a religious endorsement. However, Chum Blackburn, who, who uh, may have the Christian religious endorsement, I can go, hey, well, I can plug you on with Chum Blackburn or a chaplain of your faith. And if we don't have a chaplain of your faith, we can try to outsource to anybody off base um, and go from there. 
So whether that be Wiccan, Confucianism, Judaism, Islam, anything of that nature, we will try and find whatever fits for you and works for you. So I will also say you can't schedule appointments with him. So you can schedule appointments with me. You can always do walk-ins with us. Uh, we do have chaplains and religious affairs assigned to different units, but that does not mean, you know, oh, well, I belong to Calm unit, and I see both the fathers, which I need to update that, but both are priests or calm. Well, I like Chaplain Blackburn in that briefing. I want to go talk to him instead. I'm not going to go, well, you belong to calm. Go talk to someone else. You can come talk to any chaplain core personnel that you need. I will advise that it's always better to get advice or counseling when problems are smaller. Hey, I'm having problems showing up to work on time, and I might have gotten an LOR, LOC, or something like that. Hey, my wife and I, spouse and I are having some marriage difficulties in communication or conflict resolution. It's easier to solve problems at that time than, hey, I've got my second article 15 about to get kicked out. Conversation's a little different then, right? Also, you know, hey, we're about to get a divorce and you're our last hope and go. Okay, well that's no pressure whatsoever, right? <laughs> so, uh, so please, you can come see us at any time Feel free to know that we're here at any time, but please uh, advise, please come when the problems are smaller. Uh, we do see civilians, we do see spouses, we will see anybody. Uh, you're all part of our team here at Goodfellow, and so we are open to that. I will also say, if you sit down with one of our chapter four personnel and it doesn't fit with you, just as any other counseling, don't just write it off and go, well, chaplains and chapter four personnel suck. There's people out there that I've sat with counseling that I want to throw a punch. I mean, pray for them. <laughs> right? You know, they just didn't fit me in my situation. Maybe I didn't feel like they were effective. I didn't just go, well, counseling's a bunch of whatever. I went and found somebody who worked for me, okay? So find somebody who works for you for your issue. Cool? Cool. Uh, why else are we here? Any questions about counseling, by the way? Okay. Any other? Why else are we here besides counseling? Religious accommodation. Okay. By the way, security forces, what's up, guys? So, yes, we are here for religious accommodation. We do have a Protestant service at 11 o'clock, a Catholic service at 9? Yes. Uh, yes, 9, and uh, so you are more than welcome to those. As uh, Sergeant Peterson mentioned, there are resources off base. For example, I cannot do a Jewish wedding, but I can get you in contact with somebody who can help you out with that. Now, some of those sources may not be local. We don't have a local rabbi. We don't have a local imam. You might have to go to Midland or go to um, San, Antonio. San Antonio or someplace like that for that. But we will help you find those resources for you. Uh, if we cannot provide, we will, we will uh, find resources for you. Cool? Uh, also, religious accommodations, if you need anybody, if there's anything, beard waivers, uh, any kinds of those types of things, you can come see us for that. Last thing that we're here for is for your spiritual resiliency, and so making sure that you, you know, you got four pillars of who you are according to Air Force, right? Physical, mental, social, and spiritual, right? In my mind, physical is the one that we focus on the most. It's the easiest, right? Let me eat right, let me go and take care of myself and that type of thing, but it's also the weakest because at any point in time, we can go get an accident uh, or something else can happen to you. So if you're not taking care of your other three pillars, uh, things, you know, you need to take care of all four pillars. Cool? cool. And we're here for that journey. We do have chaplains assigned to the units along with religious affairs airmen. Uh, we do hold a events. So we are having a date night in February. Uh, we are having an airman event in March. And so if you see advertisements for that, which we're going to push out for shirts and good fellow all and those types of things, our Facebook page, you can like us on Facebook. Uh, if you see advertising, it's always truth in advertising. So if it says Protestant event, it's going to be a Protestant event. If it says this date night and you don't see Catholic or Protestant on there, we're not going to try to hoodwink you and go, welcome to our date night and you need Jesus. Guys, you're not going to do that. Uh, same thing with counseling. If you come to us and you go, check the back, I'm an atheist, I have no interest in talking about spirituality, I just want to get some thoughts on getting through this problem, I'm not going to go, well, first of all, you need, no. I'm going to work with you on who you are, okay? I'm going to encourage you from where you're at. You want all the right answers, you can know. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so, uh, we do have, uh, and don't look at those events as, 
Well, people, it, the chapel's putting on the marriage retreat. People who have problems go to the marriage retreat. Yes, people with problems go to the marriage retreat. People who also just want to improve their marriages and get more skills for their marriages also go to those uh, marriage retreats too. And so it's a whole host of people. So, um, yeah. So, any questions on why we're here? Anything? Yes, sir. They are held together. A lot of permanent party do go downtown, but we do have some permanent party that are part of our services. Uh, we do usually have fellowship meals. That's okay as long as you're not going in and doing like hanging out afterwards when movies or stuff with the students and those types of things. You can't come for religious services. We don't have a lot of child care. Uh, we're restricted by some of our money that comes in. Students don't like to give, and we're also restricted by some of the rules. Um, so we're, we're limited compared to some of the churches downtown. Uh, but if, if you're looking for a church and our services don't help, or even if you're looking for a church downtown, please come talk to us and we can see what we can do to help you out. Any other questions? So last thing is, I just want to say, welcome again to Goodfellow. Please take care of yourselves while you're here. Uh, it's really important. The Air Force, some of you have been in for a minute, some of you are kind of newer. Please, uh, making sure that you take care of yourselves. The Air Force uh, community will use you with training, with exercises, with deployments, with uh, supervisory tasks, with a whole bunch of things. And so if you're not finding ways to recharge your batteries and to do things that give you life, to help restore you on weekends and evenings and those types of things, spending time with family and those types of things, then uh, it, you're going to be burned out eventually. And so take care of yourselves while you're here uh, you may find that you have to create new hobbies. You know, I love scuba diving. Texas is not the place for scuba diving as much. So, you might get a third leg, so. You might find, have to find some new ways of, of doing things. So, please, uh, if we can help you out in any way, like us on Facebook. We have 24 hour on call chapel for if you need something or somebody needs something, uh, and we're here for you. We've got a great team. Okay? Thank you. Oh, oh yes. just one quick question. Uh, I noticed the little building over my ideas at the Religious Education Center. I stopped in there a couple times, but the door's locked. Is that like. Yeah, so that is our. So on Sundays, we use that for like religious education. Mainly the Catholics are over there, and they have some of their uh, RE classes for some of the younger people. They, they have some, some uh, young people involved in there. So. Uh, our chapel is like right. If you go that way, kind of right across the street from the uh, uh, bowling alley and, and uh, movies, movie theater. Right. And so work, you can stop by if you want to pray during the day. You're more than welcome to pray um, and, and those types of things are open. And one more thing. Um, I'm not sure where you all may be coming from. Um, I've only been here for about a year and a half. So if you can do other things, kind of reach out. That'd be five, six, top three, um, ace, asphalt. Please get out and do it. This base is really small, and your time will go by quicker if you get out and network. Um, I don't know if you can't. If you came from a bigger base, then you'll understand the struggles of trying to get things done, like finance and MPF. This is a real family-oriented base. Everybody knows everybody. So please, I encourage you to get out, meet people, and kind of just kind of talk to other career fields that you normally wouldn't talk to, especially if you're at a bigger base. So it's like a big family here. Um, all base is good, but on base, the community is really good. I mean, I'm being honest with you. I'm not going to lie to you, so. So there's a Bible verse. Bad company corrupts good character, right? You hang out with the people that you hang out with will impact your time wherever it's, whether it's here or whatnot. If you hang out with people, good fellow sucks. Guess what? Good fellow's going to suck. Yeah. You hang out with people that encourage your hobbies, encourage you on whatever your goals are, you're going to have a great time. You may not enjoy the place, but you will enjoy the people and you'll look back at that time with a good fond memory. So please, take care of yourselves. Appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So, good morning. I am uh, Richie Molnar. I am your 17th training wing OPSEC program manager for all my OPSEC activities on base. I do talk fast, I do talk quick, and I'll try to cover as much of this material as fast as possible so we can get ourselves back on the appropriate timeline. So, I always ask this question, I usually get the, the typical response of what is OPSEC? Oh, it's operation security. Now, I got that. What is OPSEC? What do we really focus on when we talk about OPSEC? Go ahead. Protecting critical information. Critical information. I like the word you use. Are we talking about classified information? No. No. Classified information has a whole different set of rules, laws, etc. that governs that. What I am specifically worried about is unclassified information that is critical, right? Good. So we got that first part out of the way. The second part is, what is a SIL? C-I-I-L. For those of you who have been around for a little bit, anybody want to take a stab at it? Critical information indicator list. What does that mean? Think of it this way. All the way from high up, they're going to decide what are some of our key things that we want to protect that is unclassified information, but it's critical that if the enemy starts getting that information, we're making ourselves an easy target, right? So from there, it starts all the way up high, and they're going to be pretty generic in what they want to cover, right? Keep it kind of real simple in terms. And as it keeps going down at each level, they hand it to us saying, hey, we want you to protect these things for us. We are going to make that a little bit more specific. That being said, we belong to AETC. So we get our initial uh, critical information indicator list, the SIL. We get that from AETC, very generic. We take that, we recraft it, because being here at Gilgill Air Force Base, we're going to have different problem sets or different critical information than what other people on other bases are going to have, right? We're going to take that, we're also going to hand that down from the wing, we're going to give that to the groups. Groups are going to give it to the squadrons, all the way down to the squadrons. One of the big reasons why we do it all the way down to the squadrons is because Com squadron may be worried about different types of servers, different types of communication stuff, right? Does LRS care as much about servers and protecting that information? Probably not, right? So it's a little bit more specific, a little bit more detailed. The only other thing I really want you to understand is that from the ATC level, typically that's just unclassified. It's not even FOU level. Does that make sense? Everybody understand the difference between the two? So once it gets to the wing and we create our own SIL off of what ATC gave us and also what we're getting from below, that will then become FOUO because it's a little bit more specific, a little bit more tailored. Here's an example of what the Goodwill Air Force Base SIL currently looks like. I'm not going to solve anybody's intelligence of reading that off to you. There's two pages to it. And now we're going to go into an example, a good example for Goodfellow Air Force Base. And for the past three years, we have trained 10 Chinese students to come through here. Not that big of a deal, right? Kind of common knowledge. If all of a sudden this year, we come to find out that we're now increasing our training input plan, or our throughput of Chinese linguists from 10 for the past three to five years, now all of a sudden we're up to 100. What's that tell you? Something new tech. We're now focused on China, right? We're now starting to prepare to look at China, things of that nature. You see how we're starting to give up little pieces of information, completely unclassified, but can indicate to other people, hey, something's going on. They're really starting to focus here. Does that make sense what a SIL is and what we're really trying to target? Yeah. Okay, good. Any questions so far? Really want to make sure everybody understands the SIL. Yes, sir. What does SIL stand for? Critical Information Indicator List. Thank you. Thank you. That's one of the big ones. We will talk about later. Everybody knows about MCT and doing all of our inspections, things of that nature. AFIs govern all the stuff we do. I will tell you that knowing what the SIL is, when we put the teams out to start talking to folks, it's maybe one of the questions, and probably the most common question you'll get asked. What is the SIL? All right, moving on. One of the other big ones when we talk about OPSEC is that we want to start talking about social media. Uh, one of the big things with uh, Goodfellow from talking with the police in uh, OSI and everybody here, is there crime in San Angelo? Yes, there's going to be crime there. San Angelo, a little bit lower than most other places, right? Uh, but some, one of the other big ones that we need to start worrying about is criminal enterprises, identity theft, extortion, things of that nature, right? Catfishing, targeting, uh, social engineering. 
We give this brief a lot to students, but I also think we need to harp on it a little bit more with staff members and or permanent party folks, uh, dependents, etc. That the dangers of social media, and I'll have a few up here listed, your social media footprint is quite possibly the devil, for lack of better terms. Is there anybody that does not have a social media profile? You don't? Good for you. <laughs> Keep it that way. <laughs> the amount of data and information that can be taken and used against you, and or also the Air Force, DOD, etc., from social media is absolutely phenomenal. If you're ever bored, just go into your own social media, start looking around, see what type of data is out there, right? Social media is very dangerous. A good example is that through social media, they were able to, and the reason why we bring this up is everybody thinks, oh, little old San Angelo, nothing happens there. Well, this was an example of a few folks that were in the local San Angelo, San Angelo area that got tied into a big, huge sex thing, child, uh, child stuff, all kinds of bad things, right? So don't think just because we're in little old San Angelo, this can't happen to us, right? And this was primarily uh, done through uh, social media. We talk about the sex offenders apps only because uh, some folks are kind of uh, not real knowledgeable on it. The best thing you can do, there's plenty of free apps out there. Try to download for, one for yourself, uh, particularly for trying to know uh, who, what sex offenders you have living in your area. For example, most y'all are new here, you might still be doing your house hunting. Download this app. Take a look at all the sex offenders that are around you. You may be okay with it, you may not, but at least you know. The key to this is having the information to know where these folks are located and know what you're getting yourself into. <clears throat> Privacy settings. Uh, this is another big one we like to stress. So, is there anybody here that doesn't have Facebook? Okay, so, okay, a few folks. Facebook is one of the big ones, and what I mean by that is how many ads are on Facebook? A lot, right? And those typically drive you to something else and you end up downloading another app or doing whatever, right? When you initially go in and you make your settings, and you, you lock everything down, you keep it private, just so only you and those of your friends, etc., can see you. You go in there and you do all that. When you go and you download another app, can other apps change the settings on what your Facebook app has? Absolutely. What I highly recommend is that you don't just set it and forget it, right? Oh, I already got it locked down. Go in and check it regularly. Every once in a while, go into your settings, make sure you have it locked down to only those people that you want to be able to see. If not, as you start downloading apps or start visiting other sites, it will start unlocking those. Why is that so important? We did a red team up, and you see on the, this was on a, a Army private that was in the local area. We were able to find all the information on the right. What does the information on the right look like? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? PII. Yeah, PII, yeah, yeah, so we want to protect that, but what else? Security questions. Security questions. I can almost guarantee you that if I really wanted to be squirrely with that data, and I find out who you bank through, I could go to USAA or whomever, take this data, call them up, and now I automatically have access to your bank accounts just by having this information. Does that make sense? That's why we want to make sure our, our, our information is locked down. Well, that's just for people being able to gain access to it, but also how much of your stuff are you putting out there? This is an example of a, a grandmother who had 1,600 Heard a teenager, they put all of her uh, savings into a couch. She didn't trust banks, things of that nature. Well, then the photo gets taken and gets uploaded to Facebook. At 23, what is it, 23.30 that evening, people came by, busted down the door, and took the money, right? So don't put too much out there. This is another good example of putting too much out. So a lot of us think back in the old days, right? You take a 35 millimeter or a Polaroid, right? You take a photo of something. The picture's a picture at that point. You can only do, or you can only, uh, Garner information from that photo or what's in the photo, right? What about this photo? What all can you get from this photo alone? So it kind of gives it away with the, the bold points that are up there. So at the time, uh, Russia wasn't supposed to be in a Ukrainian territory, right? Russia's saying, nope, we're not there, we're not there, we're not there. However, this young gentleman decided that he was going to take a photo of himself inside of a vehicle. Well, when you take a photo with your camera on your phone, what does it automatically do to every single photo? Geotag, right? Really helpful when you start trying to sort through your photos and you want to look for a specific area. It makes it real easy for convenience, things of that nature. However, that photo alone, off of his Facebook account, they were able to pull the photo and you're able to derive what the geolocation and tagging was on that photo. What did that tell them? That told them that that Russian soldier was in a location that they weren't supposed to be in. Putin's not a very nice man. I don't imagine he's still walking the earth. But 
just an example. Uh, I highly recommend you uh, turn off your geotagging on your photos. Also, because a lot of us, we tend to post photos of our kids, uh, family, things of that nature, uh, at soccer games, doing whatever. We post a lot of those photos that we take with our phone. Well, if we're putting those on Facebook and somebody's really stalking you and really wants to get after your kids or whatever, they can start figuring out, oh, not only can I look at it and say, oh, that's down at, you know, Concho, uh, Concho Valley Park or whatever, but they can find the geotag on it and start, you know, start doing your, your patterns of life, things of that nature. So try to turn off your geotag. All right, so we have a photo of here of a young gentleman who's maybe getting ready to go out on a patrol. Right out of the gate, what are the, couple of the first few things that you can see off of this that is of concern from an OPSEC perspective? There's one easy one. What's that? The weapon. Uh, the weapon. Uh, the only thing that tells me is that maybe he's not a special forces guy. He might just be a regular ground shirt. Call signs. Call signs, right? That's the first one. We're going to call that one else. What else do you all see in this photo that's of concern from an OPSEC perspective? Time. Times? Okay. Now, call signs. What about behind over his right shoulder? There's a map. You can possibly be able to derive where, what location the curve they have, right? What else is on here? Let's use this radio. If you now know those call signs and you know the radio, you know that particular type, can you go and look up that radio and find out what frequencies it's going to be on? No different than seeing a radio sitting on a table here, right? You can go and look that up. It's not encrypted, but automatically you're able to listen to the whole thing. The other thing I'll point out too is if I remember correctly, the bottom, bottom left hand corner, that was the water bottles that were used in Iraq. So now you know that this photo is somewhere in Iraq. You can try to tie the map back to the back of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? From a simple photo. Now, most of us know we want to take a picture of this, right? All right. Any questions so far? All right, the other ones we want to touch on real quick is uh, blue jacking, and we're going to talk about Wi Fi, Bluetooth, et cetera, right? So, right now, if you pulled your phone out, would your Wi Fi and or Bluetooth be active? If it is, get used to turning it off. There are tools and techniques that are out there now that can, if you have it on, your Bluetooth or Wi Fi on your phone, that somebody with the proper tools and knowledge is able to get into your phone. Now, how many of us do our banking on our phones? I know I do, right? Now all of a sudden they have access to all your banking. Turn off your Bluetooth, turn off your Wi-Fi. When at all possible, and every time you can, I know for uh, government uh, employees, we're required to use a VPN if we're not currently logged in. You should try to use your own VPN. I don't have any recommendations right now, just do your own research. But try to keep yourself a VPN, even if you're using your own uh, home computer with your own network, whatever. Makes your uh, connection a lot more secure for the enemy. Again, making ourselves a hard target, not a soft target, right? Not just really giving our info away. That rolls us into our local concerns. So here in Goodfellow, are there gangs <coughs> in the local San Angelo area? Yes, I don't think you're going to get many places that you can't get away from, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, we do have gangs. On um, base, one of our other local concerns are we do have international students that come here for training. While they're here for training, they are here for unclassified version of intel training. They will be walking around the base. Not that big of a concern. We see foreign nationals a lot of places we go. Where we would like <coughs> to ask you is that if a, a, a foreign national or a, a foreign student walks up to you and starts having a conversation, starts talking about the bills or the game this weekend, is that a concern? No, well, not necessarily. When does it become a concern? Hey, what do you do? Where do you work at? What building do you work in? Oh, you're an intel. Oh, what kind of intel are you doing? Oh, really? Well, how many people you got in your class? What, how many? Whatever, right? They keep firing questions at you or they keep digging. The one thing I will tell you to be careful with, though, is that what is the first step of trying to get information from somebody? What should you always try to do? Break down that social barrier, right? So walk it up and say, hey, are you a Bills fan? Are you a Bills fan? Who's your team? Yeah. Chiefs. 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 Oh, man, Oh man, I love the Chiefs. As soon as I say I love the Chiefs as well, I've already started to break down that barrier. Yes, I have. And I will tell you that's one of the most common uses for it. From an OPSEC perspective, we want you guys to be careful. Don't let that barrier get completely broken down just because you have something in common with somebody, right? Trying to get to know them before you start divulging any form of information. If it's critical information, don't divulge it at all because they probably don't have a need to know. But know that we do have international folks here on base. If you do have an issue with them, all the units that you're going to, you do have an uh, OPSEC unit coordinator. You just have to identify who it is within your unit. If you have an issue of this nature, go to your OPSEC coordinator or call myself, and then we'll look into it, we'll coordinate with OSI, we'll let them know, and then we'll go from there. Uh, we do have a Google Air Force uh, OPSEC uh, page. 
I think I have like three people visited so far. Uh, <laughs> the other thing I do want to point out is this one that Eagle knows. See something, say something. Look, all of us get stuck in our normal day-to-day -day life and we just drive to work, we get out, we go into our office or our building or whatever, and sometimes do you always notice something might be out of place, right? That's what we're asking you for here. Having this many eyes and ears active on the base helps everybody else out. If the only people I care are security forces, OSI, and OPSEC about what's happening on this base, we're not going to catch everything. So we need everybody's eyes and ears. If you see something, say something, and use the eagle nose. Questions? Ah, almost one hour. What questions do we have for OPSEC? Sorry, I flew through that one as fast as possible to try to get us caught back up. Um, just, if you can, if you walk away with anything from today, know that OPSEC is present on base. We do have a sill. You do have an offset corner. You just go to them if you have questions. The last one I'll leave you with is this. So during COVID, we've been kind of behind a little bit on trying to get everything caught up and keep up with numbers, all that stuff. We have not been doing our offset red teams as much as we normally would. However, we are getting back into the game of that. Somebody might be sitting there thinking, well, what is an offset red cell team? Great question. An offset red cell team means that we're going to put teams of <clears throat> casual lieutenants, we may grab some airmen, some staff members, whatever the case may be. And we may intentionally put them into your unit to try to see how much OPSEC you are violating. Meaning, uh, a lot of folks, one of the common trends we notice is uh, on wherever your printer is at, right? They'll print things out and then they don't necessarily throw them into a shred bin, gray bin, etc. They end up just kind of tossing them off to the side. Well, we walk by and grab it and it's all just labeled with FOU. Well, that's a big number, right? We're also going to do things like just coming up and trying to see how much information I can get from you, either on base, off base, it doesn't matter. Uh, Pro Realm has kind of given us a, a very wide swath of things we're allowed to do to try to make sure everybody's abiding by it. So please be careful. And the very last one is Goodville Air Force Base is on a gray bin policy, or all shred policy. What's that mean? So if you work in a classified environment, that's pretty easy. Everything goes in a shred bin. Think the same thing on the unclassified side. Any white paper in any way, shape, or form, whether it's your information, somebody's information, it doesn't matter. Take that paper and put it into one of our gray bins. Those gray bins are locked. The reason why they're locked is because as you throw that information in there, you can count on that information getting pulverized, shredded, pulp, whatever you want to call it. So we have a contractor that come out and they're going to shred everything for you, and then you don't have to worry about that going and hitting the trash bin. Uh, the amount of information you can gather from a base just by their trash bins alone is phenomenal. So please, make sure you're shredding all your white paper. Last questions? Only one to go the Thank you, welcome to Goodfellow. There's good hunting, there's good fishing, and the uh, best steak I've had in Texas so far is up in Marines. It's um, up in Buffalo County. Fabulous tomahawk, right by the county. I'm here to give you guys your counterintelligence awareness briefing for San Angelo, Texas, and give you your criminal threat assessment for Goodfellow and uh, San Angelo, Texas. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to raise your hands. This is everything we're going to go over today, counterintelligence awareness, criminal threat, talk about sex extortion, uh, talk about sexual assaults, and then go into recruitment and eagle eyes. So first off, counterintelligence. So in the world of Goodfellow, we are an intelligence base, right? Um, that's a, one of our primary missions here. Intelligence is collecting information, right? Collecting information, sending it out to our forces. My job, OSI are the only ones uh, authorized in the Air Force to investigate counterintelligence. So my job is to protect this base from any threats, insider threats, or foreign entities trying to steal our information. All right, my job is to prevent these things from happening. Espionage, sabotage, subversion, and terrorism. Uh, OSI, again, is the only entity within the Air Force that investigates Uh, CI awareness, so our biggest threats obviously to the US government, Russia, China, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. What do they want? They want our military secrets, they want our technologies, they want our resources, okay? The biggest thing to take away from this, guys, is Russia, China, all these bad countries are not gonna come to San Angelo, Texas to exploit our information. 
Okay? They're going to try to get inside. They're going to try to get inside with fellow, inside your squadrons, inside your units to get our information. How will they do this? Um, OPSEC guy said this a little bit. Um, they're going to try to get it online or face to face. He talked about going into San Angelo, Texas, uh, interacting face to face with someone. Okay? Um, you have to think that here in San Angelo, you have a lot of cowboys, right? A lot of white blood American men here in San Angelo, Texas. They could be trying to get information from you, okay? You may want to trust them more because they look like you, they sound like you, they talk like you, but they could be working for another country. They could be working for another military. So when people come up to you and ask you those questions, are you in the military? You can answer that question. What do you do in the military? I'm security forces, I'm intel, I'm fire, okay? You can answer that question. When they start asking those bigger questions, what do you mean you're intel, intel okay? Where do you do your job on base? What is a skiff? Okay, how do you get inside a skiff? Those kind of questions. Um, and where does your commander sit inside Goodfellow Air Force Base? Where, how do you get access to your commander? How do you log into a computer? Okay, those weird questions that most people don't ask you, those are the questions you should stop from talking and report those to your offset or OSI right away. All right, um, same thing when it goes to online. All right, people can communicate with you online via Facebook, Instagram, pretending to be other people. All right, you may see that you have mutual friends, but they could be ghosting someone else. All right, if you don't know them, you don't for sure know who they are, please do not give out personal information. Um, right here we have Monica Witt. Um, little Air Force story, Monica Witt was one of our top counterintelligence agents in OSI. All right, um, these movie things are real, these things, spies and all that kind of stuff are real, real life. Um, she fell in love with the culture of Iran. She fell in love with it so much that she deflected to Iran. She is wanted by the US government, by the FBI. She has all of our secrets, our technologies, our resources in her brain and is using it with Iran. Okay? These things happen. Protect your guys from insider threats. If you have people within your units, within your squadrons, that are doing things that are out of the normal, all right, that stand out to you, please report those things up your chain of command right away. All right? These foreign countries want our military secrets, they want our technologies, they want our resources. They do it for political, ideological, social, and economic gain. How does this affect Goodfellow? We have foreign visitors, okay? Um, foreign visitors come to see Goodfellow every now and then that we host, but we do have foreign students, okay? Uh, international school, we host intelligence foreign students and firefighter foreign students. Um, they learn unclassified information, they train directly with firefighters, all right? But we have to protect that. We don't know what their main purpose is here besides education, all right? So again, like Offset said, if they come up to you, please have a normal professional conversation with them. They're digging deep into their, your lives. Please report that stuff to us right away. Um, that's it. Your reporting requirements, if you look at AFI 71101, that will list all your reporting requirements for the Air Force. All right? Um, I suggest you guys looking those up to know what you need to report in certain uh, different situations. Um, we have insider threats. Report any misuse of classified uh, material. Report any contact or personal uh, information. That could be face to face when you guys are out and about in San Angelo, um, at the bar, at the restaurant, or while you guys are online through email, text message, social media, and things like that. Uh, CI dangers in Goodfellow and in San Angelo. Again, we have a strong foreign population on, by, on base. We host about four to five countries within a few months. Um, on top of that, we are two hours away from the Mexican border. Okay. Um, there's a lot of illegal immigration coming through West Texas and Southwest Texas, a lot of drug smuggling, cartels uh, here and there, so be careful when you're out in these small towns. Uh, foreign intelligence students and firefighters coming to Goodfellow Air Force Base, we talked about that. And then on top of that, we have um, foreign population at Angelo State University. Um, they have a lot of foreign students coming from China, coming from Asia, and things like that, uh, getting an education here. So be on the lookout when you guys are out and about. Uh, criminal threat. So criminal threat, the way that OSI works, we, our jurisdiction is that red area, West Central Texas, anything to adversely affect the military, OSI would respond to that area. Right now, San Angelo and Goodfellow are at a low criminal threat. Compared to the bigger cities, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, they have a high threat. Here in San Angelo, we do not have anything off limits or blacklisted, okay? Um, areas of concern, though, are the northern and western parts of town. The northern part of town is older, more poverty, more rundown, um, and then you have the western part of town where there's more money, newer establishments, newer buildings, newer restaurants, and things like that, so just be careful. Um, more likely to get a theft or burglary, things like that. Uh, Angelo State University, 
Again, we do host a university in San Angelo, Texas. Our lingua students do live at Angelo State University, so we do have to protect them more and watch out for them. <coughs> to, um, make sure that they remember that they're not college students, that they're in the military. Um, use caution by DOD personnel, vape shops, tattoo shops, and bars and clubs. Okay, um, nothing is off limits in San Angelo, but we do work very closely with the vape shops and tattoo shops here. All the bars and uh, establishments here in San Angelo do know us. Okay, um, it's a very small town, very big military population, and they don't want me to blacklist something because that takes away their money and it takes away their business. Okay, um, so vape shops, go buy your tobacco, go buy your tobacco vape, all that stuff, but please do not buy CBD, please do not buy hemp. Be careful when you go to tattoo shops. Some tattoo shops in town do sell illegal drugs. Um, be cautious when going inside. Bars and clubs, same thing. My life, who knows what can happen with alcohol in your system. Did you have a question, sir? No. <coughs> All right. Our drug threat does increase immediately. Okay. Um, Goodfellow is a tech training base. We have all the branches of the military here. Um, Majority of our population is from 18 years old to 24 years old. Um, people come from all over the world, different walks of life, raised differently, come from states where some drugs are legal. Um, but now for the military members, they have to realize that they cannot do marijuana, LSD, mushrooms, or cocaine. That is what we see here on a regular basis. People may excuses that I get is I was stressed, I needed a way out, or I just didn't know. Well, now you know not to use synthetic marijuana, no CBD products, no hemp products. Anything that contains hemp or CBD, including shampoos, conditioners, lotions, foods, uh, supplements, you guys cannot consume as DOD personnel. Um, OSI, we use confidential informants. That's how we handle drugs on this base. Um, someone in this room may be a confidential informant for me soon, um, but that's how we get it. The people that you do the drugs with, people that you hang out with, people that you are friends with, they are snitching on you the following day, all right? Motorcycle <coughs> gang threat, uh, we're very low here in San Angelo. Uh, we do have street gangs, the Aryan Brotherhood, Latin Kings, and Mexican Mafia are major concerns. They're racially driven, obviously. They do not. So street gangs, Aryan Brotherhood, Latin Kings, Mexican Mafia, racially driven, obviously they don't like the way you look, the way that you are, please stay away from them, they come in contact with you. The Menditos is the largest motorcycle club, outlaw motorcycle club here in San Angelo, Texas. Uh, they were born here in Texas, but they are now the largest motorcycle club in the world. They are outlaw and they will try to recruit you. They love military members, please stay away from them. Um, on top of that, if you go two miles outside of the Jacobson Gate, you will see a building formerly known as the House of Skulls, which is changing to Hernandez MC. That is an outlaw motorcycle club. Um, please do not go in there, because they'll probably punch you in the face. Um, Bandidos, that's what their symbols look like, that's where their patches look like. They try to recruit you, if they try to ask you to ride with them, please report that to us right away so that we can assist you in that matter. Extremist groups. An extremist is a person who holds extreme or fanatical political or religious views, one who resorts to or advocates extreme action uh, resorts to or advocates extreme action. AFI 51508 says that everyone in this room cannot participate in extremist activities or organizations. You guys cannot support extremist activities or organizations. That includes gang activity and organizations. That means liking posts on Facebook, okay? You guys have freedom of speech, you guys can be who you are, but you guys represent the Air Force, all right? So if you guys are on uh, Facebook and you guys are liking things from the Three Percenters, Proud Boys, Antifa, uh, extremist organizations, you guys can get in trouble with the DOD. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, domestic militia extremist citizens who come together to protect the country, usually during an emergency. Some militia extremists, however, seek to violently attack or overthrow the U.S. government, often calling themselves patriots. That's a big issue that we're dealing with right now. Um, one of the things that we have learned from the Capitol riots that we just had the one year anniversary for was a lot of military members were involved. A lot of military members were breaking the UCMJ. Okay, as a military member, you guys cannot support these organizations or support these causes. Your job is to protect and defend the country of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Okay, no matter who the president is, no matter who's in charge of our government, all those things, whether you like what they're doing, whether you don't like what they're doing, your job is to protect them at all costs. Questions, concerns? No? All these symbols are just an example of extremist organizations, but all extremists Symbols, uh, gang symbols are not authorized on military or, uh, installations. 
Um, they were considered contraband, and you will be asked to remove them. Sextortion. Um, sextortion is one of the big things in the military when it comes to social media and online dating. You guys will probably experience this or have a troop that experienced or has gone through sextortion. If this happens to you, um, if you guys don't know what sextortion is, it's when people are trying to extort money from you because of a sexual act. Uh, sending pictures, trying to threaten you with your nude images and things like that. They may try to extort you for money. All right, I just had an incident the other day where an airman was trying to be was being sextorted for $400 um, because someone supposedly had nude images they were about to post online. All right, my advice to you, please take it. Do not send them any money. All right, no matter how big the threat, no matter what they try to entice you with, they may even show you a fake post that they're about to blast it all over Facebook. All right, please do not send them money. All right, ignore them, let it be. They will not post it because then they are risking a felony. All right, if this happens to you, please report it to OSI right away and we will help you in this situation. Sexual assault, sexual assault is the number one crime in the military. All right, um, here at Goodfellow Air Force Base, we do have some uh, different avenues of approach when it comes to sexual assault. First thing I wanna tell you guys is do not let anyone force you to come to OSI. Do not let anyone force you to go to SAR. That is your right. If you become a victim of sexual assault, it is our job to teach you what you want to do, ask you what you want to do. Do you want to report it? Do you want to go to SART? Because that is protecting the victim's rights. All right, if you are a mandatory reporter, all right, if someone tells you something that happens to them, yes, you have to report it, but they do not have to come talk to me. Your victim does not have to come talk to me if they do not want to, all right? Um, if they do choose to talk to me, they do have some options, all right? A victim of sexual assault can provide OSI a statement and participate in an investigation. What that means is I will bring the victim in, they will tell me what happened to them, and then I'll ask them if they want to participate. What that means is I will keep them in the loop of the investigation. I will keep them updated, I will ask them follow-up questions throughout my investigation. Or they can say, uh, I want to tell you what, hap what happened to me, but I don't want to participate in an investigation. Okay, that's perfectly fine. You'll tell me what happened to you, I'll ask you a lot of questions, but then you'll never talk to me again. All right, um, I will coordinate with your SBC if you have one, or you will not hear about this until you are asked about legal proceedings. Or they have a third option. They can say, hey, a mandatory reporter told me, uh, a mandatory reporter told you that something happened to me, but I don't want to talk to you, and I don't want to participate in the investigation. That is A-OK, okay? okay? That is your right. If you don't want to talk to me, you sign the statement saying you want to talk to me, but I say this, that if I find out from another person another mandatory reporter and I have enough detail, I will still open an investigation. That is my job. I still have to investigate what happened to you, whether you want it to happen or not. My advice to you, if you want no one to know, go do a restricted report, okay? Um, other than that, if I find out information about a crime, I have to investigate it. Um, OSI is not the beer police. Um, this is a big thing here at Goodfellow. We work directly with the wing commander. Um, with the textile environment, a lot of kids here are going to uh, experiment in life, okay? Underage drinking, doing things they're not supposed to be doing, breaking military rules, being out past curfew, having off sex in the room. Well, OSI cares about felonies. OSI cares about victims of crimes. So if someone gets caught up breaking a rule that the military upholds, and a felony happened to them, we care about that. So please do not be afraid to come report something to us. There will be no repercussions if you are truly a victim of a crime. Cool? Um, if something happened to you, please tell us. Um, finally, with this, you do not need anyone's permission to come talk to OSI. Okay? You do not have to run it through your first sergeant, your supervisor, your MTL, your instructor, or anything like that. If you want to talk to OSI, you come talk to OSI. Please do not let anyone stop you. Uh, finally, OSI recruitment. If you guys are interested in OSI, uh, we take senior airmen to tech sergeants. You can't be past six years as a senior airman, past 11 years as a tech sergeant. We are major crimes and counterintelligence investigators. Uh, we are federal agents. We go to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center with the other three letter agencies for our basic training. Uh, you can be enlisted officer or a civilian agent. Um, within OSI, uh, we do work for the Department of the Air Force. We do not work directly for the Air Force, we work for the Department. So we cover the Air Force and the Space Force. Um, if you become an agent, you can specialize in the following career fields. Eligibility, uh, you have to be a U.S. citizen, have a driver's license, be at least 21, um, be able to obtain a TS clearance, and be willing to serve as an OSI special agent in any capacity. What that means is OSI are the ones that see a lot of dark things in the military. We see death, we see murder, we see homicide, we see suicide. 
Okay, we are the first one to, to respond to a body. Um, we see child porn, we see child sex crimes, we see rape, um, we see people beat their kids. All right, we see a lot of things that most people don't want to see every day. Um, you have to be mentally able to handle the situations because you don't get to choose what you investigate or what you respond to. So if, you're, if you feel you're eligible, if you feel you're able to handle that, please apply. Um, no law enforcement experience is necessary or required. Uh, any AFSC may apply within the retraining window or if you are a career airman, you can apply at any time. Um, officers and civilians may apply as well. Obviously, you need a bachelor's degree. Um, if you're interested, we are located in building uh, 818. Stop by for any time for any questions. Eagle Eyes. OPSEC talked about this a little bit, um, but we, our Eagle Eyes program is run by OSI. If you see something, please say something. All right? Um, crim, counterintelligence, terrorism, anything that could adversely affect you, the base, the military, anything like that, please report it right away. Um, you can call OSI directly, call the law enforcement desk. Um, if you ever want to leave an anonymous tip, anonymous tip, please call that phone number up there. If you can't get a hold of uh, OSI, please call security forces or the command post. Uh, we are located in building 818, that is between the bowling alley and the theater. Are there any questions? No? Welcome to the public. Place ethyl Yule or PA material in recycling bins. Around Goodfellow, you will find these giant gray bins. They look like trash cans. They will have little slots in them and locks. One, if you are disposing of information like ethyl Yule or PA, you want to place them in there, and they will be shredded and removed. Use PA stickers when you are removing the uh, in. PA cover sheets or folders and papers. 
to one employee privacy act on the proper forms that, that require FOU loan or PIA. Do not place PA privacy in for PII and SharePoint or the shared drives. The shared drives, like, like the name says, it is shared drives. It means that anyone can access them. So we'll find a lot of times people will put like PII, whether it will be phone numbers or social security numbers in the shared drives, and we'll have to go on there and report a breach. This, uh, for, to safeguard your email, there are a few examples of uh, how to do that. By labeling them, whether they contain FOUO or PII, which you can see in the top right corner. And you can also encrypt and sign the information. Once you um, label it FOUO, it will, it will put its information, put that with FOUO in the subject matter and give you the information, which is right above where you would typically put your email. Like, th this email contains FOU. And once you do that, it will encrypt it where you will require a password, a password signature that you typically use to, uh, for your email or your Air Force portal. Common instances of SharePoint breaches, failing to remove obsolete data, or uploading documents without ensuring access is restricted to those who need to know, or upload documents are not being actively monitored. That means uploading information that needs to be disposed of, or not placing an FOU for official use only, for those who need to see it and those who don't need to see it. Now, uploading information can be major. Like, uploading PAA and PII can ruin people's lives. It can cause thousands of dollars of damage, maybe even ruin their entire lives. That's why if you're found guilty and fined of uploading privacy actual information or PII, you can be fined up for $5,000 and even sentenced to prison. So if you ever find any Privacy Act from information or PII, report it. The government, any, any individual that causes the breach can be sued by the individual. The victim can spend thousands of dollars just to, on lawyers to protect their information from all the theft that and damage caused by the breach. When you see a breach, report it to your base privacy act manager, and the commander will appoint an investigating officer for the breach. Any questions? If you ever find a breach, these are in a few examples of people you can uh, report it to. You're free to go to lunch. Be back by 1300. We will start the information fair at that point.
Okay, hi, I'm Senior Sherwood. You might have seen me lurking in the back uh, all morning, uh, but I'm Public Affairs. Uh, so we kind of, I don't know, do you Public Affairs stuff? Everyone's at Public Affairs on base, right? Cool, so you guys all kind of know what we do. Uh, so we have three prongs. So command information, media operations, and um, community engagement. So command information, obviously that kind of stuff is gonna be getting information out to you guys. Uh, you know, our job is to kind of keep you informed, keep the commander informed, that kind of stuff. Um, so that can be anything from updating our website uh, to updating social media. Uh, like you kind of heard earlier, we update you guys on you're going to be coming in uh, for work. Or if there's going to be like an active shooter exercise, different things like that. So we kind of try to keep everyone going. Community engagement, uh, we have a huge, huge kind of partnership with our community. So that can go, I mean, so we've got the rodeo parade. It's a huge, huge thing, or even just the rodeo. Um, Veterans Day, loads of events kind of happen around the community. So we are there for, for a lot of that, um, as well as like community partnerships. Uh, you guys kind of heard about like the do little scholarship and all that kind of stuff. Uh, another part of it is uh, media operations. So that can be anything from just uh, let's say there was like an after shooter base or something like that. Media's going to call in, they're going to ask what's going on, that kind of stuff. We're the ones that are going to try to keep them informed. Uh, we push out stuff so people can kind of know what's going on. That can also be, let's say media approaches you and they ask you questions and you've never been in front of a camera before. You can come to us and we'll train you on how to kind of talk to them, uh, what to say, what not to say, that kind of stuff. So we have two different sections, uh, technically three, um, but we can shit on that. No. Okay. So, uh, photo and video. So, obviously, for photo, we take photos. Wild. Um, so, that can be anything from just photography support. Uh, so, you can come in, take your shaky takes and everything. Awesome. You got an award. We're there for you. Uh, you need an award photo. Uh, something to put in for a package. Awesome. You can do a photo shoot. Uh, it is award season now. I don't think any of you are up for it since you just got here. But if you are, please get to it. Uh, we're also out there for a lot of stuff for like, security forces. Uh, we kind of do crime scene photography, we call it alert photo. That's also part of uh, photography. For video, pretty much the exact same thing we do with photo outside of the photo studio. Uh, we cover stories, um, we do live streams just like this. Um, I think that's really for video. Something super crazy. There is uh, alert video, it doesn't happen all the time. And if you'd like to visit us, um, so right now, obviously, we're streaming on YouTube. So that's what's going on right now. Uh, our web has a ton of stuff. We put up so many stories, and we put up so much like useful information. It's definitely good to check it at least like once a week, kind of see what's happening. We also have an app. Um, don't remember what the app is actually called at this moment. But if you just look at Goodfellow on like the Apple Store or on the Android uh, Play Store, I don't remember what it's called. Uh, you guys can find us there as well. And then obviously we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Facebook has most of our internal information. Instagram, we post loads of amazing photos and videos uh, just to kind of see what's going on, especially like fire. I don't know. We have some Intel stuff, stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, that's really it. Any questions? Cool. That's it.
we have a lot of info for y'all today, so bear with us. So I'm Ms. Camacho, and this is Ms. Robinson. We're from the Medical Squadron. Um, I'm in charge of the patient travel program there, so for any reason you don't need that, you can come see me. And then Ms. Robinson, she's in charge of the FMP. So our mission is Ready Medics for Ready Air and Space Force, and our vision is to become operation-focused medics who set the standard. We're kind of doing a tag team so that you guys can hear us on both sides. Um, so some of our uh, medical goals are to maximize the readiness, empower, um, empower better health, um, champion better care, quality and safe environment, and proactively manage resources at a lower cost. Free. Ah, I get that free. <laughs> So whenever you come into the clinic, we do have a policy. We're going to ask you for three identifiers, your last four, your full name, and your date of birth. So just make sure you have all that in hand. It's a little tricky, especially when it comes to your kids. We ask the dad, what's your kid's date of birth? And we get, uh, <laughs> it's like, it's always the dad's too. <laughs> uh, some of the objectives, um, introduce services available at the Ross Clinic. Uh, we provide guidance to access the medical care during and after duty hours. Um, we have tips and other information that we'll touch bases on as we walk through the slides, and then we'll be able to answer whatever questions you might have. So the services that we provide, dental clinic is for active duty only. We have family health, flight medicine, mental health for active duty only. Optometry, right now we don't have an optometrist, but if you're needing anything to do with optometry, Either you can call the appointment line or come see um, our personnel at the front desk and they'll get you squared away with, to do next. We have pediatrics, physical therapy for active duty, student clinic, and women's health. Do I have a lot of instructors in here? Okay, I have some info for y'all later. Next slide. Okay, um, we have health promotions. Right now it is currently unavailable. Um, immunizations, laboratory, pharmacy, pharmacy refill, uh, public health, and radiology. Um, I was going to ask, what's health promotions? I'm sorry? What is health promotions? You know, to be honest, I'm not completely sure. <laughs> I do apologize. Um, yeah, we're kind of new to the um, Ross Clinic, to the uh, medical group as well. It's kind I of think like OPSEC, where it's promoting health, but honestly, that's exactly what it is. It's like, hey, if you want to fight diabetes, here's the things you need to do. Okay. We're going to talk about your diet. We're going to talk about exercise, living healthy, that type of stuff. Okay. Oh, Sorry. I like that. No, Sorry. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Learn something new every day, right? Um, so currently, we do not have emergency services available at Ross Clinic. Um, we'll touch bases on that slide as we get a little, little further out. Um, we'll go over your options that are available to you after hours. So no show. We don't like no shows at the clinic, so make sure you arrive at least 10 to 15 minutes prior to your appointment. We do have some doctors that are real picky. They will not see you if you're past 10 minutes. And then after that, they'll let you know what you need to do, reschedule, come back at a later time. If you can't make your appointment, just make sure either you can call the appointment line as well. Okay, um, so this is for the student sick call. Currently our hours are Monday through Friday. Um, we open up at 0615 and then we close at uh, 016. Okay, I don't know the other time. 4.30, <laughs> sorry. Um, we do have extended hours for the sick call students, so those are from 0 to 6.15 till 7, and then again after lunch. Um, you can report there at 12 for after lunch, but I recommend that you come in maybe 10 to 15 minutes prior because those slots do fill up um, pretty soon. And also they, they're kind of like a first come, first serve basis, and they are based on like the emergency that you need. For the instructors that are on podium, you get seen at sick call for any acute issues, okay? So make sure you're there too on time. So these are gonna be our pharmacy services. Right now we are um, low man on pharmacy, so they close between 11 to 12, and then they open back up. So just bear with them. Wait times are a little bit longer right now. Um, they are closed on training days, family days, and federal holidays. Um, 
you must check in at the pharmacy after you get seen by the provider, okay? Because um, otherwise you're just gonna be sitting there waiting if you don't check in with them. Next one. And just to kind of piggyback off of this, um, the automated system is really good for calling in to pick up your prescriptions ahead of time because the pharmacy, like she said, we're kind of on demand there in that line and the wait time can be extremely long. So if you call like before 10 a.m. Monday, it can be available to you the next business day or after, okay? Okay, exchange to ex uh, Express Scripts Auto Refill Program. Uh, this Express Scripts will require an annual consent um, from patients who want to receive automatic refills or medication enrolled in TRICARE Pharmacy Home Delivery. So this is also available to you as well. This also goes for, for any reason you want your husband or your wife to pick up your pharmacy meds. You have to have a consent on file, okay? So this right here is over the counter for instance if you have a cough cold, you can always uh, go to pharmacy. I'm not too sure that they're doing this right now because we are still swamped right now um, with COVID. Um, so I'm not sure, plus we're a little man. I don't think they're doing over-the-counter program, but you can always call the appointment line and ask them um, to see if this is still available right now. Okay, our safe disposal of medications. When you enter our clinic to the right-hand side, you'll see a med safe box. Um, you can drop any prescriptions here, whether they're expired or old, just things you don't need anymore. We do not have access to that safe box, so you don't have to worry about anyone going in, um, checking your information. It's strictly just you drop it off, and the company comes in and kind of take care of that for us. No sharks, though. No syringes or anything. <laughs> So physical therapy we have um, for active duty only for any reason. Um, Captain Langness cannot see you for a certain reason. She will send you downtown to get seen by pharmacy there. Um, that's more guidance just depending on what's going on with you. And we do have mental health, which is the building, the small building in the middle building, I think it's 1007. Um, mental health will be located right Okay, allergy immunization clinic hours, um, allergy shots, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 10.30, um, that's appointments only, and then for adult and pediatric immunizations, it's Monday through Friday, um, 07.30 to 11, then they do break for lunch, and then they're back again at 12 to 1600. So this is just telling you um, for the beneficiaries that we do have lab immunizations and radiology. Um, like I said earlier, optometry right now, we don't have an optometrist. Um, so if you're needing a referral to get seen on face, just let the appointment line know and they'll get you squared away. Family, family advocacy. Um, this is great for um, parenting classes of all ages. Do you have any new parents? No, smart, smart. <laughs> <laughs> Counseling for couples, that is number one, for me anyways, and my husband, but I guess not during football season. Um, new parent support program, and there's plenty more. Um, this is very helpful if you wanna take a screenshot of this with your phone. Um, it's very helpful for yourself and if you have teenagers as well. So these are some of the classes that the fam uh, Family Advocacy um, offer. I'm pretty sure y'all probably went over a little bit of this prior to us. Um, but we have Becoming Love and Logic Parent. We have Caring for Children, Through a Divorce, Daddy Shark. Mm. Daddy Shark. That one sounds interesting. <laughs> um, we have Couples Communication class. We can all use that. Doesn't matter if you're five years, 10 years, 20 years in your marriage, we can all use it. Um, active parenting with teens. I have a teenager. It can be stressful. Definitely check this out. Anger management. I keep giving my husband this number. He keeps on losing it, but that's also a good one. He probably gets mad and throws it away. See, I like you. I like you. That's what's happening. I believe it. We have prenatal briefings and new parent support programs. Uh, these are our dental services that are available um, Monday through Friday at 7.30. Um, you must arrive no later then. And you check in with their front desk as well. Um, I don't think we have any students in here, but that care is limited um, to students anyways. 
Um, the permit party, active duty members, um, scheduled for annual exams and dental claim. I think, are they doing a clean exam? I don't know if they're doing hygiene. Oh, whatever. Okay, I'll have to double check that. But you can definitely do some dental clinic and there's the appointment number if you have any questions. So this is um, the patient travel program. So pretty much if we can't see you at the clinic, you can get reimbursed for travel. Um, usually if Shannon can't see you, because that's pretty much who we have here in town, Shannon everywhere, um, they will send you either to Abilene, San Antonio, Dallas area, um, just depending on what specialty you're needing. For it, if you have that, um, you can email me, come see me, and then we'll get you squared away when it comes to DTS and all that stuff. Uh, the ESMP, this is actually the program that I'm a part of. Um, it's tailored for the medical clearance for your dependents um, when you're overseas. It is a DOD requirement for an overseas tour, and it is also DOD required if you have dependents that have specialty care. Um, these are just kind of a list of some of the things that are considered specialty care, um, like asthma, developmental delay, speech. Um, it could be physical therapy. So any type of care that's sought outside of a uh, primary care physician that will automat automatically qualify for a specialty care. And in that point, you will need to go through the ESMP program um, that will be laid. I'm pretty sure the majority of you just got here. So that'll be on your way out. If you have any questions about that, you can stop by the clinic, ask for Melissa at the front desk, and I can go over all of that information with you. So this is the patient and family advisory council. Um, they join every second Thursday of the month on Facebook, so you can follow them there. And then, if you really like me and Ms. Jordan, you can give us a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and then we're just gonna kinda cover how you can access some of the care at these facilities. Um, this is our appointment care line. If you wanna take a snippet of this with your phone, um, you can do a number of things here. You can make appointments, reschedule appointments, cancel appointments. You can leave a message with your healthcare team. Uh, you can reach the pharmacy, lab, radiology, referrals, medical records, um, patient advocate, and um, the list goes on, but you can pretty much access anything with that phone number at the top if you have any questions. So this is the TRICARE Online Patient Portal. So pretty much everything she said you can do on here as well. Um, you can see your lab and radiology results. You can do secure messaging. You can also talk to your provider on there as well, or the nurse. You have the nurse advice line. You can do refills, and you can also book appointments. And just to kind of add, the nurse advice line is really helpful, especially because the clinic closes at 1630. Um, the, night, the nurse line is available 24 hours. So you could call them to get information um, as far as like if you need a referral or if you need to be seen for an emergency anywhere, they can give you uh, information for that as well. And this is just a screenshot, an example of TRICARE Online on how to um, book an appointment. Okay, and this is another screenshot of the securing messaging, um, just how you can reach out to your providers or the nurses if you have any questions. So this is um, the nurse advice line portal. So you can do a lot of things on well for any, you're just not sure about something, you can always message them through there. Okay, um, and just in case, you're seen at a different facility, like you go into an emergency room, um, you may receive a bill from them. Um, you can contact our facility or the facility that you were seen at and you want to give them your information, um, all your like your social and things like that, so that way they can get that taken care of. If that doesn't work, you can also follow up with this 1-800 number to Hamana and speak with the claims department so that way they can help you get those taken care of. And if all else fails, if step one and two doesn't work, please come into the clinic so that way we can kind of help you um, work through that situation. Um, for that, sorry. <laughs> so 
So urgent care versus emergency care, this is a big one. Do not go to the ER for a paper cut or just something minor. You're gonna get a bill and you're gonna have to pay for it. Um, urgent care, all of my active duty, you have to have a referral before you go to urgent care. If not, you're gonna get a bill, okay? It's a little different when it comes to dependents, have them call the appointment line and they'll um, talk them on what they need to do next. But for urgent care, active duty has to have a referral. Please don't go without one. We do have two emergency um, facilities. They're both Shannon now. Um, we do have a standalone ER, which is over there by Sam. Do not go to that one. You will get a bill. You'll have to pay for it. And they'll tell you, yes, we tra take track care, but they don't. Okay. Yes, so don't go to that one. That's code for we'll take your money. <laughs> okay, uh, this is kind of what Ms. Jordan mentioned about the freestanding ERs. Like she stated, you definitely do not want to go there. Try to avoid them. I mean, unless you're rich and you don't mind paying it out, but if not, definitely avoid those. So this is talking about legal guardianship. So under state law, a minor is under the age of 18 must be accompanied by a parent or legal guardian um, when they attend their medical appointments. Um, step parents attending appointments without mom or dad must have legal guardianship paperwork on file in order to make a decision about the child's care. And then you can find the power of attorney paperwork if you need it at base legal. And there are um, some exceptions. A minor can consent to care in the following conditions. Um, if a 16 year old minor is living independently, care of pregnancy, minors who have children whom they have um, guardianship of, drug abuse, addiction, counseling for suicide, and um, other diseases. Actually sees these comments. Yes. As well. And so, whether they're good or bad or just you know neutral, take them serious. But we want to hear good and bad because we want to improve on the bad. But we want to hear the good because the people that do good, they get recognized and they get you know a pat on the back or they get awarded for the good job that they've done. So both good and bad, we want to hear both. Don't be scared. Yep. Definitely So your health records don't belong to you. They are part of the DOD. They belong to us. Um, right now, I'm pretty sure y'all have paper records um, that are following you. But right now, everything is electronic. Usually, you can't hand carry your medical record unless you have a memorandum telling you otherwise. Um, if you need a um, copy of your medical record, just come see the front desk, and they'll give you the paperwork to fill out so you can see the copy. So for my instructors, the Med Squadron, we are about to migrate over to a new system, over to Genesis, okay? Make sure the, your kids are enrolled into Humana. If not, we're going to have some problems when they come see us, okay? Ask them. They should get enrolled when we do newcomer free every Tuesday. But otherwise, um, if they're not, have them call the Humana number. I'm pretty sure y'all have it. Humana, uh, Humana came across the other. No? Okay. They should be here too, I think. Um, make sure, my active duty, make sure you're rolled into Humana. Hopefully by the end of the week, you've already called to show where all your dependents, including yourself. Everybody has a doctor here on base. Um, because once we um, switch over to the new system, it's going to be hectic, so bear with us. Students might be there a little bit longer than usual during sit call until we get the flow rolling over there. Um, so if you're wondering where your kids are at, they're probably 
at the clinic. So you have to bear with us, wait time to be a little bit longer on the first couple of days us going live, okay? Do y'all have any questions? Yes, sir. We already have a Genesis profile set up from previous days that it's going to carry over. Yes, it should. Should I back up the over? Yes, it should. <laughs> <laughs> No, so you're gonna have to call, and you're gonna have to get enrolled into Goodfellow. Okay, so every time you can see us, you have to call to us for Humana. I know like California side is HealthNet and all that stuff, but here it's Humana. So you need to call and switch over all your everybody to get enrolled here. Is that just dependent on the region that you're from? Is that so? Yeah. Is that the virology is just that same region as Goodfellow? You would still have to call to get in panel right. here to see our doctor. So if you were in panel, that little rock, they have different providers there. So you would still have to call to get enrolled to see one of our doctors here. So, so just to answer your question, you know, just you're calling basically to change your PCM to this type group right here. Right. That's, that's what you're doing. And your family member. Okay. Yeah. So
urgent care, that's another big one. Make sure you're sure you have a referral. So that's pretty much like the TRICARE piece, what it's gonna cover. Um, you can come for any reason. When you go get seen at the facility, they're gonna ask you, hey, can you see your military ID card? Yes, it's okay to give it to them because they're probably gonna get a copy of it because it has your beneficiary um, ID on it, on the back, and they need that. Or if they, they're gonna might ask you for your social, make sure they have the correct social on the system because that's how Humana um, does the billing, okay? So don't be afraid to give them your ID card if they ask you for it. So if you, if you for instance, you do get a bill in the mail, you can call that facility and be like, hey, what's going on? They probably just have um, the wrong number or something in the system that's not triggering to pay for your stuff. So just make sure they have the correct social or the number on the back of your card. They can get it fixed that way. Um, you can call command yourself. If not, y'all can come see us at the clinic in the referrals office and they'll get you um, squared away after that, okay? So, there's a lot of POCs. Yes, sir. So for in Colorado for after hours care, for referrals for care, just call the nurse by the same thing here? Yes, yes, sir, and they'll put in a referral for you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We do have keys at the clinic for the dependents. Um, I also want to add to that there is TRICARE information in your folders um, as far as the pharmacy and then um, just like the information sheets for the local emergency rooms, all of that. Pretty much what they covered, but off paper. Make sure y'all are squared away by the end of the week before we transition into this new system, okay? All right, if y'all have any other questions, y'all can come see us at the clinic. We sit right behind the front desk in the bullpen, so just ask for us. We're hiding, but we're back there. Yeah. <laughs> All right.
so far? No? Okay. We're almost done. Um, we have, so on our sheet, TRICARE is here. Do you want to be called TRICARE or Huma Humana? Either. Okay. So she'll give more information specifically on TRICARE slash Humana. So um, that will kind of clear up some things. Um, I'm just going to go over, so I'm going to go over the voter representative, so that would be the last one, so that we can, um, once, once Denise goes over everything, then we can take a break, and then I believe it's family advocacy, and then finance, and then we'll be done. So, um, what I passed out was the voter, voter registration and absentee ballot request. So um, basically what this is, regardless of you guys being stationed here, you still have the right to vote. So with that being said, um, for you to request your absentee ballot in the, in the state that you are registered in. So this, is, this form, if you fill this out and send it in, um, you can also gather more information from, if you turn it around, there's a questions spot that says, Vote at the, the vote at fvap.gov. Um, if you go to that, that will give you more information. If you just go to fvap.gov, that will also give you information on your absentee ballots. So, um, if you guys still want to take advantage of your right to vote, please do that. They will it will give you all the information for whatever state you're located in. Um, and as far as getting that absentee ballot. Any questions? If you have any further questions for voting, please come to the Airmen and Family Readiness Center and we can get that for you. Um, yeah, okay, cool? Cool, okay. Tricare East Region, and it's 1-800-444-5445. And just let them know, hey, I've moved to Goodfellow, I need to get my museum changed, and they'll get everything taken care of for you. A move is also considered a qualifying live event, so if you need to make any changes to somebody that's on the policy, like go from prime to select or select to prime, whatever you need to do, now is the time to do so. Those qualifying life events are good for 90 days. So go ahead and take care of that part too. Um, on your handout, there's, I think it's about four paragraphs down, there's a phone number in there, 325-654-3149. Keep that one with you. That's the appointment line for the main group here on base. That's where you'll go to get appointments. If you need referrals to go off base to a specialist, it all goes through that number. Um, we do not have an emergency room here on base, but there are two hospitals downtown and they're both listed on your paper with the addresses. It's Shannon and Shannon South. Um, anything in town that's called Shannon is good to go. They've bought pretty much everything, so if it's got Shannon on it, they're network. There's one freestanding emergency clinic here in town. I can't remember the name of it, but it's not Shannon, so don't go there. Uh, also on that paper, almost to the bottom, is your uh, urgent care clinics for here in San Angelo. If the med group doesn't have any appointments, they may send you downtown to one of the urgent care clinics. They'll put the referral in the system, and then you can go to that visit. Um, just make sure you're letting them know, hey, I need an appointment or I need to go to urgent care so they can get that referral to them for you. They don't do, well, they don't like to do backdated referrals, so 
So it's real, real good to make sure you've got that in there beforehand. Um, the providers here do like to make copies of your ID cards so that they can get all your uh, benefits information. Everybody knows about your benefits number, right? On your ID card, you've got a benefits number and that, or your social, will get your claims paid. If normally, if you get a bill in the mail and you know you've got your referral in the system, then go ahead and call the number on the bill, find out what's going on. Sometimes it's just a matter of they didn't get the benefits number loaded right into their computer system. And if that's all it is, just give them the correct information, they file to us and it's done. I don't really want you to pay that bill until you find out what's going on because it's really hard to get your money back from those providers. They don't get their money as much as we do. So hang on to it until the very last minute. If you can't get anything resolved with the provider, call us at that 800 number that I gave you for TRICARE East Region and let us help you work it through. Um, on the back side of that TRICARE tips, there should be a list of civilian pharmacies. Um, we do have pharmacy on base. Everything you do on base is free, obviously. But if they don't have the meds you need, you can go downtown and get one of those civilian ones. Um, is that the one that's back up? They want to receive meds. Good deal. Uh, as of last month, December 15th, we no longer have Walmart or Sam's. So don't go there. They didn't want to renew a contract with us. But good news, we got CVS back. So those are on there. We've got two of them here in town. You can go to either one of those, any of those on that list. And the co-pays that are on there are for the dependents. The active duty service member doesn't have a co-pay at civilian pharmacy. So that's what your ID card does for you. Uh, we do have dental here on base, and um, we have an optometry clinic, but at the moment we don't have an optometrist. So if you need something done, even a routine eye exam, just call the number on the other side of the form, let them know, hey, this is what's going on, so they can put a referral in before you go downtown with the civilian optometrist. Um, that's pretty much it. If you have any family members that didn't come with you when you call us to get yourself enrolled, just let us know, hey, don't do Mary Sue or whoever it is, and we can do a split enrollment. That's not a problem. We do those all the time. If they're going to come later, then don't change it until they actually get here. Any questions for me? Yes. So, everyone keeps saying that I'm a here. At my last days, I got my eye exam. My name is the standard of the new glasses. I believe you can still get the glasses here, but call the number and they'll help you figure that out. Thank you. Yes. Going off of that, does TRICARE cover only contact or glasses, or do they only cover glasses? They'll cover, uh, well, actually, they don't cover glasses, and the contacts are only if it's a medical necessity problem. The medical doctors are medical or medical. And that rarely happens. Um, probably, I mean, I know it's not wonderful, but the best bet would probably be those great issue ones from the military. They've gotten a whole lot better than they were when I was active duty. <laughs> the BC glasses? Yes. What? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, don't forget to call and get everybody that's here with you enrolled. Here, even if you came from the East Region, another spot in the East Region to here, you still need to make that phone call so you can get enrolled at Goodfellows. It's not an automatic transfer when you change duty station. And if there's no other questions, then welcome to Goodfellows. Thank you.
the break until 1500. Um, so one thing I want to cover, I know it has been brought up a couple times about the NFLAC, but I figured we would talk a little bit more about um, what the NFLAC is. Raise your hands if you know what NFLAC is. Cool, awesome. What does it stand for? A military and family life advice counselor. Take out the advice, but yes, yes. So um, at our base, we have um, an M, a, a few M flags. So as Teresa had stated, there is a couple M flags that are at the schools. There's an M flag at the CDC for the kiddos, um, but we also have an M flag available for the students and also for permit parties. So we have an M flag. Terry is her name, Dr. Bates. Um, located at the Airman and Family Readiness Center. And then we also have, um, I believe it's three MFLACs that are within um, the training squadrons. Um, so I think they're considered surge MFLACs. Um, so they are available to you guys as needed. Um, you can come in and say, hey, I would like to see the MFLAC, and if they're available, they will um, see you or you can contact them and schedule an appointment. So if you take a look at the brochure that is in your folder, um, Dr. Bates did put her number down um, in the case that you would like to schedule an appointment or even just ask some questions. Um, as it was discussed, they are confidential. They don't write anything down. Um, if there is an appointment scheduled at the Airman and Family Readiness Center, basically the person just comes in and says, hi, I'm here to see Dr. Bates. Um, and that's all you really need to tell us. So, um, and she can, as far as like any life events or if you're struggling with anything with being at this base um, or just need someone to talk to, I mean, there, there are the options available as far as, you know, at the chapel um, with the NFLAG's mental health. So. Uh, the M flag here is available for permanent parties, students, and then spouses as well. So, any questions as far as the M flag? Kind of went through that pretty quickly. No. Cool. Awesome. All right. You guys can take a break until 1500.
Everybody ready? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Major John Valesky. So I'm your family advocacy officer here at Kutel Air Force Base. I'm also the mental health flight commander. What I'm not is your family advocacy nurse. I'm just the administrative supervisor. She's out with us today, so I'll be covering this brief. But, um, in any case, I'll be trying to hey, I have 15 minutes. I'm going to try to roll through these things, but I'd like to keep things pretty informal uh, so I can you know, allow for questions, people interrupting me, and that type of stuff. I'm here for it. OK? Cool. All right. That is us, and that's our phone number. It's number 1600. OK, so this is our mission. Um, build healthy families through implementing programs, policy designed to prevent and treat domestic violence and intimate partner um, violence, as well as child abuse. So um, we're in the military. Um, we're a transient community. There's uh, this program in every single branch. Like you call it something different, but there's this entity just about every single military installation. Mandatory reporting, it is policy that all active duty members report uh, uh, suspicion of physical, emotional, sexual abuse and neglect. Um, we report it to you, report it to us at the advocacy or your command or, um, or uh, first sergeant. So we'll make sure it gets dealt with before we're going to do These are risk factors um, that I'm going to go over with you that we've noticed as uh, trends within the military community. Um, risk factors does not mean that there is abuse or any kind of um, uh, violence happening within the home. It just means that these are these tend to be things that we've noticed um, during lessons learned that we've reviewed when there have been maybe a uh, fatality due to domestic um, violence or child abuse, what sort of things were present. So job change, house hunting, obviously if you go to a new base, you're under a lot of pressure. You guys are probably going through that right now and it's for an extra new base. So it's mm -hmm. a lot of pressure on the family, right? transition, not just um, for the adults, but obviously the children within the home as well, and we're the place that you go to if you need help with that. Um, you'll have to come after we've been done treatment. We have preventative service as well. And if you know other families that are going through trouble um, with the problems, you can come to us and we'll give them. Uh, newly married, new baby, um, blended families, single parenting, all these things are stressors. Uh, you can imagine if you compound both of going to a new base and having those kind of stressors, it just makes things more stressful, right? When we're in a military community, we always try to look like we have everything together, we're trying to impress people. It's kind of a recipe for a lot of the treatment that we have. There's a history of abuse, and there might be a history of poor coping skills, so we are here to also help develop those things. Substance abuse, obviously, a risk factor. Um, weapons in the home, all those things. From lessons learned that we've had from fatalities um, in the last 20 years or so, we're going to be able to go over shaken baby syndrome. Shaken baby syndrome is something that we are obligated to uh, brief every single newcomer and every active duty member because this is the uh, biggest uh, cause of death there's domestic violence in the home, domestic violence within the home that results in um, death is shaken baby syndrome. And the percentage is most of the time that there's a death because of uh, domestic violence. Um, Periperical crying is something that we're going to offer anybody that is expecting parents or a new parent. Periperical crying is the only intervention right now, I believe, that has empirical evidence to prevent um, shaken baby syndrome. So, uh, anybody here a parent? Isn't raising kids real easy? Oh, yeah. So, they come with that instruction? <laughs> yeah. So, periperical crying, a lot of people don't know about this, but every single DOD installation, just like I said before, we are pushing this out. Um, we're a transient community, right? So we don't have grandma, aunt, uncle across the street that we can just go down to and get those kind of supportive services. Um, and we have new parents that don't know what to do or the baby will not sleep at, at night. And what is normal, what is not? Um, and it's all brand new. We don't have necessarily parents um, available, grandparents or that extended family available to us. And it might be a little uncomfortable to contact the first sergeant or commander, even though I'm sure that they'll be there for you. It's not the impression a lot of newcomers don't have yet because the extra of the family is out there. So um, this gives a little bit more control and education to uh, new parents. Uh, Periperical crying, just ask your primary care manager. Really, if you let 
Yes, that is the definition of form of child abuse that occurs when an infant or small child is mildly shaken. So it's not coincidence that I have a period from crying slide over for this one. Um, most commonly happens when very, very tired parents um, are uh, having a baby that just won't sleep and don't know what to do. They're overwhelmed. Victims of shaken baby syndrome, usually less than one year old. Um, be careful. Uh, majority being less than six months. 25% of victims, yes, die from their injuries, 80%. I've uh, unfortunately been working in child welfare for uh, about 15 years. Um, I've unfortunately, every shaken baby case I've ever seen is always is either death or lifelong um, injuries. Seventy-five percent are male. Yep, biological father, other perpetrators include moms, grandparents, step parents. Little or no experience of caring for an infant. So what you'll see about uh, it's very sad, obviously, when these happen. But you're going to see very caring people. They're not murderers or anything like that. They just get overwhelmed in the situation. It takes a split second to make that decision to shake the baby. These are the injuries. Um, all of this. So a lot of brain damage. Blindness is very common. Physical disabilities and obviously death. Yes, so these are the symptoms. So yes, it's not always completely evident. You might see a baby that is extremely lethargic, however, it looks normal. These are internal injuries we're talking about. Um, extremely irritable, primal, have difficulty breathing, seizures are very common for these. Inability to repent, indicating there's possible neck injury. Um, inability to focus because the eye and the sight is completely impacted. Just being prostrated. Mm -hmm. So that's all we have on uh, shaken baby syndrome. Are there any questions about shaken baby syndrome? Okay. So family advocacy. So we're going to move not, it's not just about child abuse or shaken baby syndrome. It's about intimate partner violence when you don't have to be married. It's just an intimate partner. The definition of an intimate partner going to airport um, is having a sexual relationship, a past sexual relationship, obviously married and sharing a child together. Um, Physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, emotional abuse, medical, um, which would be also for the lack of something to that degree, um, would come to family advocacy. Now, this I include sexual abuse. You don't go to the SAR for these cases. If you do the SAR, you refer to family advocacy and it's a designated intimate partner. Do you, is it all Air Force in here? Is it in the Army? No? Family Advocacy New Parent Supports um, Program. That is technically what I'm representing today. Uh, your Family Advocacy Nurse is Ms. O'Brien. She runs the program. So anybody that is an um, expecting parent or has a child or children up to the age of three qualify for this program, and we will offer you services for other services. So it's offered to dependents um, and or active duty members. We can do home visits. We can check in. We can offer support services for when you have uh, your baby, you can uh, lactation consultant, um, we offer infant massage, prenatal, um, uh, prenatal programs, um, and as well as a daddy uh, boot camp, um, parenting level one, all these things to help you prepare for your new little one that's coming into the world, or after uh, he or she is born, we can help you adjust and find services if you feel that there are uh, some potential medical needs or other services that are necessary. They offer similar services on um, civilian land. Obviously, we're not going to ever be having your baby on our on base here. You're probably going to Shannon. Uh, we will work with their in home nurses as well. Things are a little bit different from the military environment and um, the, uh, the stressors that are going to be on new parents um, that, don't, that are going to be area and those type of things. So things will be slightly different and specialized, and we'll be able to offer you new parent support program. Um, questions about new parent support? So we screen through the uh, women's clinic, uh, pregnancy tests, if you're on positive, there'll be a screening, we can offer you services at that time. Uh, we'll get notifications from Shannon uh, for prenatal services from their OBGYN. Um, yeah, and we'll get notified uh, when they need to serve delivery through TRICARE and we'll continue to offer you services that way as well. Yeah. Six 
missing nurse, also known as the fan, is the person who's the POC. Her name is Miss O'Brien. And if you don't remember her, just ask the major with the ski at the end of his name that works in mental health. <laughs>
Hi, welcome to Goodfellow. I'm sitting here with uh, Coach from Finance. I've seen some of you already. I'm here to brief uh, the uh, finance portion. Uh, where we're located, we're located at the Norman Brown Building, Building 430. Uh, there's legal in there, personnel. All your admin people are there. Our extension is 5181. And we also have a customer service portal, the CSV, if you're not familiar with it yet. If you've been on the Goodfellow website, there's a link to it. And you can actually submit tickets there if you don't want to walk to finance and sign in and wait. In processing, we have a permanent party in processing Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays at 10 o'clock. Uh, you can do your ditties there. Uh, just bring a copy of your orders. Uh, this is the CSP portal. That's what it looks like. Um, does anybody have any questions as far as finance or anything? Basically, at that end process of briefing, we'll take care of everything. All your lodging, uh, TLE, uh, anything that pertains uh, to PCSing. We'll take care of that for you if you want to change your state of legal residency. We have forms there. Uh, if you have any questions at all, we have open customer service hours all day, unlike some other bases. Um, and uh, on Tuesdays, we have our extended hours. We close at 1600. So any other day, it's 0800 to 1530. Uh, I work the counter, so you always see me there. Um, feel free, if you're not getting paid, especially come and see us, because we could do partial payments. Uh, if you have any troubles that you could have worked at your old duty station, uh, we're more than happy to take care of that for you here. We're, uh, we're, we'll get the right people to help you out with that. So don't stay silent. We're here to serve you, and welcome to Gutfellow. Thank you, Coach. All right. I just want to let you know if something happens to my pay, I know that's your fault, but if I see you first, I'm going to let you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I'll take care of you. <laughs> uh, I will say by far, this has been the best finance experience I've ever had when I came by here to serve you. So, thank you, Rob, do it to your recruit. Thank you, sir. We take pride in that. Like our, yeah. Whatever you're doing.